Hey, deserving listeners, it's just me today. Today, I'm doing a, I don't know, semi-deep dive into Charles Manson or Charlie Manson. I am a little conflicted about doing this episode because I, uh, I, I think that when it comes to these kinds of individuals who commit horrible crimes, I think there's some problem with even talking about them. I've talked about in other episodes about how when we prop up these individuals, we not only ignore perhaps the more important story, which are the victims or how to prevent these kinds of things or that sort of stuff. Um, and it's, and instead sort of like he, we sort of create these heroes. And I'll, uh, so I have a, a little bit of a problem talking about it today. So, uh, but I think the story is is important in a number of for a number of reasons which I'll get into but but also uh, a good portion of the ending of the the conclusion of this episode is is going to be about why are we so obsessed with Charlie Manson it's been 50 years almost and we're still he's still a part of our lives which is strange in some ways considering all the other events and people and figures and you know, uh, actual heroes that, that we could uh, hold up, you know. Um, so, so that's what I'm going to talk about today. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. I, I want to start the episode by talking about an experience I had when I went to France, Paris, and specifically the Louvre, the, you know, the big museum there. Um, I was uh, being, uh, I, I was on a little tour. This tour guide was walking us through and, and the tour guide said, oh, okay, so here's the big, the big moment, uh, the big reveal, the big, the, the most important piece in all of the Louvre. And I'm thinking, oh boy, you know, what, what's coming up? And, and, he, and he says, and around this corner is the Mona Lisa. And, and I was like, oh yeah, Mona Lisa, that's right. Yeah, I've, I've, you know, it's one of the, I'm not an art person. So I, I said, oh, okay, I've, you know, I've, I know the Mona Lisa. <laughs> I've heard of it, blah, blah, blah. And I came around the corner and I instantly was, uh, everything sort of shifted in my head as I took in the scene because one, the painting is not large. When you go to the Louvre, there, a lot of their highlighted paintings are at a minimum like i don't know six feet by six feet kind of a thing mona lisa i think is i don't know maybe two feet maybe even less than that so so as just a visual feast shall we say it it uh, it was not impressive because um you actually can't get close to it because there's the, they rope it off and it's behind glass. It's behind. It's it's one of the only things that's behind plexiglass. It might be the only painting behind plexiglass, and they they rope it off. It's, so you have to. There, no one can get within like I don't know maybe twenty feet of it. So it's a small painting behind plexiglass, and no one can get within twenty feet. But practically that uh, because all this press of people just crowds close to this this uh this rope that unless you waited there for a half an hour and sort of uh, pushed your way to the front you you you're you, the closest you could get practically is probably more like 30 or 40 feet or something maybe i'm exaggerating on the feet but it's pretty far and there's just this huge crowd of people and one thing that i've realized recently as tourists as as a tourist is that when I was growing up, when whenever I went to a tourist destination, there would be a minority of people who had cameras. You know, there was always one person in the family. Maybe it was the dad. Maybe it was the mom. Maybe it was the older brother. But someone, there was only one person who had a camera. And also, you had limited film, right? Because every 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 shot you take was another fifty cents or something. And so, people didn't take that many pictures. You would. You would walk, you know, one person would walk up, take a picture. But for the vast, vast majority of people, they just, they just didn't take pictures. It just wasn't in their lifestyle. Well, now everyone takes a, not only just a couple pictures, but it seems like people are taking pictures constantly. You walk through the Louvre and it's just a, a constant uh, selfie cell phone thing. Now, 
you know, I take a S ton of pictures myself, so I can't judge. But anyway, I walk up to the Mona Lisa and it's just, just filled with people taking different selfies. It's all, it's all about self. And I'm thinking this, a selfie with you and the Mona Lisa is not going to be a good, it's not going to be a good shot because this picture is behind plexiglass and it's 30 feet away from you a- and it's not going to translate well into a Facebook picture let's just put it that way <laughs> but anyway uh, you know so I'm just being so so that was my experience so I walk up to this thing and I all I want to do is look at the crowd so I, I you know I see the Mona Lisa over there and I'm like huh okay fine and then I'm like but look at this crowd of people and so I actually went around to the side and took pictures of the people and all if people from, you know, this is Paris. So it's people from all over the planet, right? All walks of life, all religions, all ethnicities, all uh, sort of attitudes. And But everyone is doing the same thing. Everyone is trying to get a picture of themselves with the Mona Lisa. And you can see everyone because taking a picture like that requires some geometry in terms of figuring out how to how far to put the selfie stick away from your face and how to work the Mona Lisa and how not to bother the people around you, which some people seem to not really care about. And so it was just this fascinating thing to watch people watching something. Well, to me, this is the same experience I have when it comes to Charles Manson. I'm not terribly interested in Char- Charles Manson as a person, honestly, especially the more I learned about him. I'm just like, eh, you know, he, there's, and I'll get more into that later. It's just like, there's something sort of mundane about him in terms of the, the things that he did compared to other people like him that have done similar things. Um, but I'm much more interested in our fascination with Charles Manson and other people like him, you know, like Ted Bundy and Jeffrey Dahmer, and more recently, Elliot Roger. Uh, for those of you who don't know Elliot Roger, he was the um, University of California, Santa Barbara, Santa Clara, I don't know, one of the Santa <laughs> uh, in, in California. Uh, it was, I don't know, a few years ago, he murdered, it was a murder-suicide of, um, he killed, I, th- I don't know, six people or something. And it, it was an internet sensation because he, I don't know, I won't even get into it really, but, but, but I have an episode of, I made it, I've, I've made up, you know, I've made over 600 episodes and almost 700 episodes, put them on YouTube. Well, my episode on Elliot Roger is in the second place regarding views. It has the second most views of all time of any of my episodes. What's in first place? Well, the first place is my episode on on Ramsey Bolton from Game of Thrones. If you're familiar with Game of Thrones and you're familiar with Ramsey, well, Ramsey is like Charles Manson. So, so number one is Ramsey. Number two is Elliot Roger, who's kind of like a Ramsey Bolton. And then I'm sure this episode on Charles Manson will also get a lot of views. So it, it's just interesting to and, and you know I, I have episodes on all sorts of things that I would consider to be just as if not more interesting than Elliot Roger. And yet my, the Elliot, and I think I made the Elliot Roger episode years ago, you know, and, and every day I get emails about from people reacting to that episode because they just discovered it, you know, anyway. So the, the more I study these people, it's not really my expertise, right? I'm a therapist who, works with people. I'm a supervisor. I'm an educator. These sorts of people, Charles Manson, um, you know, Jeffrey Dahmer, the, these aren't my research area. But because of because everyone is, is always asking me to do episodes on these people, and I occasionally um, accommodate that, I, I've, I've come to uh, get to know these people to some extent. But honestly, the more I get to know them, the more mundane they become to me. The stories are just so similar. You know, they they have terrible parents. They go through terrible childhoods. Throughout their early childhood, into their teenage years, into their 20s, there's an escalation of criminal behavior. They eventually escalate to murder. There's a huge media circus, and everyone freaks out, and there's lots of media coverage, and there's lots of 
people wondering, is this the end of our society? And there's a huge debate about guns and blah, blah, blah. And then after that dies down with no changes, by the way, then there's a, a, a cult following that emerges from a few, from a select few of these individuals. So, you know, uh, of the countless people that are like this, there there's like a small percentage that somehow due to their media presence or that the story that they tell, there's a, there's a cult following that emerges. So with Charlie Manson, many of you might know that there, that Charlie Manson has a cult following, but so does Elliot Roger now. So there, there are people who email me or comment on YouTube about Elliot Roger. And if you don't know Elliot Roger, good, but he, he's just, he's just another one of those people who just, you know, had a terrible childhood seemingly and had an escalation of behavior and then eventually went on a killing spree one day and then killed himself. So it, 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 and he has this huge internet following and I get, I get emails and comments from people telling me how much they think, how much they respect Elliot Roger, how they want to be like Elliot Roger, how they identify with Elliot Roger. And it's just like, it's interesting, you know? And, and same with Charlie Manson. There's, there were exact same situation. People, for 50 years have been saying that they identify with Charlie Manson and that he's a hero. And it, it's, it's, uh, it's just, it's, it's me looking at the crowd of people looking at the Mona Lisa. I'm looking at the crowd of people looking at Elliot Roger. I'm looking at the crowd of people looking at the Mona, Mona at the, at, the, at, um, at uh, Charlie Manson and Elliot Roger. And, and then, you know, there's countless documentaries and movies and stuff, and, and we eat it up. And I'm going to get into that uh, later, too. There, there are, I, I looked into it. There's actually a lot of, um, I don't know, legitimate art, shall we say, about Charlie Manson that I didn't know about. Um, people, Charlie Manson was a, a songwriter, and so there's been a lot of people who have actually recorded his music recently, like Guns N' Roses and stuff, which I'll get into. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to provide a, uh, you know, brief, brief summary of Charlie Manson and, and also the time he lived in, because I think it's important to understand the, the, the culture and the times of America in the, in the 60s. And then I'm going to look at what people are saying about him. And I'm going to try to figure out why we're still obsessed with him 50 years later. Okay, so let's um, let's get into his his early life. So, uh, as again, as I was saying earlier, it's a very typical childhood in that he his parents were psychopaths themselves, seemingly both of his parents. But we have more information on his mom. Uh, so his his mom uh, exhibited criminal behavior, antisocial behavior. Um, his his father abandoned the family, and his mother was only 15 when she became pregnant. I think 15, if not 16. After Charlie was born, the mother continued her criminal activities that she was exhibiting before he was born. It seems that Charlie Manson would have been a, an accident, uh, accidental pre pregnancy. This was in the 30s, I think. Let's see. Yeah, he was born in the 30s. So just think about that. She would his his mom would flirt with men in bars and then lure them to a secluded place where her where her boyfriend not Charlie Manson's father where her her new boyfriend would rob them so that was that was how she made her living was she would go to bars flirt with guys lure them away from the bar and then they would rob them and she would leave Charlie with other people for days at a time she seemed like she was probably an alcoholic and she exhibited a lot of shady behavior and event and she there was there's just a whole story there it's it's there's a lot of that's one thing about charlie manson's life is that there's just a lot of data there because he's done a lot of interviews people because of their fascination have really investigated all this sort of stuff and so if you want to learn more there, there's countless documentaries you can look into but so so the mom had a lot of criminal behavior and um and when Charlie was a child, she actually went to prison for three years. And I think he lived with his grandma. And so he he was not only abandoned by his dad, but his mom was shady and would disappear at times. And when she was home, he, uh, he, her and the rest of the adults in the family would verbally abuse him and humiliate him. 
And on several occasions, his mother tried to sell him or put him into foster care. It's a really sad story, actually. And, and it's one that I, I've seen before in my early days as a therapist when I used to work in agencies. There, there's a certain profile of a single parent who is struggling with addiction and perhaps PTSD who uh, just ha- it, it, it has all the hallmarks where the, the parent will be frequently trying to uh, give their child away, uh, leaving their child with friends and family, and then disappearing for days, weeks at a time. Um, very shady behavior, unknown where they disappeared to. It, it's, it's just a very common story. And if, if you work for CPS, and I know some of you out there do work for CPS who listen to this podcast, you, you've, you know, you've seen countless stories like that. Um, it's not usually alcohol these days. It's it now it would be opioids or uh, crack or you know um, that kind of thing. So uh, it's just the cycle of uh, again probably the genesis comes from trauma and self medicating to uh, deal with PTSD from childhood traumas, and then that leads to a, a lifestyle in which you have to continually uh, feed your addiction because the withdrawals are so terrible. And also when you're off the drug, you have to face your trauma reactivity. And then, uh, then you sort of slip into a life where um, hour by hour, you're trying to score, uh, you're trying to score easy money and you're trying to score um, your, your substance that you need to self-medicate. And, and basically, it makes it so that it's very hard to pay attention to your children, and you end up having tons of shame, which results in even more use because uh, the only thing to get rid of the shame, really, uh, seemingly, is to continue using, and it's just this downward spiral. And in, to, in today's world, often what happens is CPS will eventually get involved and uh, take the kids away and put them in foster care. And so... And I've worked with families like this before where the I, at various stages, either in the beginning when CPS first – before CPS gets involved, maybe I even call CPS, um, in the middle where the kids are um, you know, feeling terrible about being abandoned by their parents or after um, – or when the, when the parent, single parent, is trying to go through recovery and get their kids back and then after the kids are reunited with their parents. It's, it's very – there's a very typical story, and and so Charlie Manson had a had a very typical situation like that, and 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 he had a very typical childhood behavioral presentation. He was he he exhibited early psychopathic behavior, what we might call conduct disorder or oppositional defiant. He was he was cruel to others. He hated authority. He would get revenge uh, on other people. For example, he one story is is that he didn't get pre- presents for Christmas because his family was poor. So he rounded up several presents from kids in the in the neighborhood and he burned them all in a fire. So you know that 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 there there's devious, cruel behavior from a kid, and then there's that right. This is like extreme uh, to actually p- plan out go out, get everyone's presents, heap them in a pile, put some gasoline on them and burn it all. It's, it's a very uh, particularly conduct disorder, psychopathic behavior, and is the precursor to the rest of his life. Now, we can absolutely make sense of this, given his childhood. You have a dad who totally abandons him. You have a mother who only gives out love every now and then and and abandons him, uh, tries to get rid of him, isn't around, uh, pawns him off. And, uh, and also, when the mom was around, would exhibit cruel behavior herself, humiliating him, also uh, teaching him really terrible lessons too. Like she, she would try to pass on her, her knowledge of, of manipulative criminal behavior to him as a, as a lesson in life or something. And, and so he feels hurt by that. He feels abandoned by that. He, he w- wants attachment. He's not getting it. And uh, there's this actually really sad thing. There's this interview with him that I saw in which he said, 
His only happy memory from his childhood was this one time when his mother hugged him. So, so just think about that for a second. His, his only happy memory as a child was this one time when his mother hugged him. I mean, if you're a parent out there, that'll break your heart. What, if you're a parent out there, what you want, when your kid is 40 years old, what you want your kid to say is, I had many happy moments. I had a happy childhood because my mom hugged me all the time. But imagine you're Charlie Manson. You're saying, well, my mom, this one time, I think it was like she got out of prison or something and, and she exhibited strange affection for him. And, and because she's like, oh, yay, my son. And, and she hugged him. And it was this reunite, reunited moment that, you know, really, he really remembers, you know. And, and so he grows up feeling terrible about himself, uh, worthless, um, no sense of who he is, a sense that he's shit, you know, that, that he is um, below, uh, you know, dirt in that no one pays attention to him, no, his parents aren't giving him enough love and attention you, you know there's this notion that kids will will start to internalize that that the reason why their parents aren't stable and giving them attention is because they're not worth it themselves it's just like well if i was a better kid if i was a better person my parents would pay attention to me more and so th- there's a lot of hurt in there and then from that hurt comes a lot of anger and from that anger comes a lot of notions of revenge and impulses for revenge and impulses to try to harm other people to elevate yourself. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a common human uh, uh, behavior. We've all done it. Whether you can remember incidents of where you've done it or not, you've done it before. You have, uh, you know, I don't know, you're, you're five years old and you're feeling like no one likes you at recess or something. And instead of being functional about it, which you know, you certainly could be, but there are times when you're not functional about it. And so you walk up to someone and push them down and just be like, you know, you just, you just walk up to some kid, push them down because you're upset that no one's paying attention to you or something, or you're four years old and you throw a rock at someone's head because you you just, you just don't like the fact that your, that your parents are giving attention to this other kid or something, or you're 13 years old and you start talking crap about, some, uh, someone who gets a lot of attention, you know, some, the pretty girl in school is getting a lot of attention and, and you feel as though you don't have, you're not getting enough love. And so you, you start talking crap about her, you know, you're just like, well, she's not all that. And she's stuck up and she thinks she's cool. And she's not, you know, we've all done that. And there's adult manifestations of that too. We, we, we never get rid of that sensitivity and that, that mechanism to, it, as, a, as a defense of our own insecurity and our own pain, we, we want it, a temporary fix to that is to inflict pain and humiliation on other people because in, for a brief moment, we feel like, well, at least I'm not that person. At least, uh, at least I'm better than that person because I'm not stuck up or I don't have a rock heading toward my head. <laughs> and, and it's this brief moment of, of feeling uh, a little bit better about ourselves because because we're not as low as this other target. And so take that to the extreme. You're Charlie Manson. You've been treated absolutely terribly, and you will have a need for that defense mechanism even more. And so you'll, you'll want to uh, even overpower other people as a way of coping with this huge empty hole in, in, your, in your psyche. So during it, his teen years, he starts to rob stores with a gun, um, he, so this would have been in the forties, um, while in one of the reform schools, cause his parents, you know, his mom would send him to reform schools to get rid of him. He, uh, he alleged that he was raped by one of his teachers. We'll never know if this was true or not. It seems plausible. Uh, I think it was even like a, like a priest of some sort, but it's also plausible that he was lying because he was already a little, um, psychopath. And so, you know, it's totally plausible he was lying, but it's, but it seems plausible, honestly, when I, the, the little bit I read about it seems as though, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's possible that he was raped by a uh, teacher while he was in these schools. 
uh, as uh, later on he started he started raping people as well including boys he would hold a razor to their throats and and rape them so you know there's a lot of early you know very concerning psychopathic behavior so i just want to pause here and assess whether or not he how smart he was i want to answer the question as to whether or not he was a genius the the answer is no he was not he, his iq was tested at 109 that that's that's high it's above average but it's not a genius by any means it's it's when the it's within the normal range of um it's it's not it's it's within one standard deviation of the mean so him and other people like him comprised you know like the 80 percent bell curve zone so he's 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 above average but he's still within the the typical normal range for humans and he was illiterate because i think his education was poor and he might not have taken it very seriously so so that's just another factor in in terms of what sort of careers were available to him once he became an adult he 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 couldn't read or he what it was very hard it was very difficult for him to read okay so going into his 20s again there's a lot of data here but i'm just sort of skipping through <clears throat> he spent many years in prison he really adapted to prison life and actually kind of liked it he, uh, it was it was very segregated by race and he began to really hate black people he learned how to manipulate women into being sex workers because he he would talk with uh, a lot of other inmates about their techniques in terms of crime and and he would talk to pimps a lot and he found out that it was important you had to find young women who who had quote unquote daddy issues and then you needed to break down their egos and you also needed to give them love and attention as long as they were obedient and occasionally you needed to beat them because and they were sort of used to that because they came from abusive childhoods and so he really learned how to find uh, easily manipulatable, you know, manipulatable young women and how to keep them under control. And that's a very important lesson that he learned. He also read the book, um, How to Influence People by Car- Carnegie. How to, as a, you know, it's that famous book, um, how, to, how to Influence People. I can't remember the exact title, but that book was also very important to him as well. So he is trying to do, he's he's doing research at this point and he's trying to you know he he wants to he has an urge to control people and again it makes sense given that as a child when he was treated terribly one of the lessons he learned was if i'm not in control then i get screwed if i'm not in control then people abandon me if i if i it, unless it, and if I can somehow manage to get control of over other people's minds and and therefore their behavior, I can actually keep them close to me. I can keep people close to me because c- that's what I need. That's something that I think a lot of people don't talk about enough is that psychopaths are not from another planet. They they have the same basic needs that everyone else has, meaning that they they have a basic need for attachment. Now there are some psychopaths that don't and my hypothesis about people that don't really care about other people and they're psychopathic my hypothesis about about them is that they typically don't commit crimes because they basically just isolate themselves and watch tv and go on the internet and they don't they don't really care about interacting with people so there's no real reason to murder anybody you know whereas Charlie Manson is the sort of psychopath who still has that deep need for attachment and closeness and community and love. And, and because of that, he is compelled toward other people and, and, you know, and, but because of his issues, he, it's really hard for him to establish secure attachments with other people. And so he ends up resorting to these controlling behaviors as a way of trying to keep people close to him. Okay, so uh, so he learns all these things. He reads this book. He learns from the pimps, and then in, uh, he's in and out of prison for various different crimes. Um, and then in 1967, he's released from prison, and this is when all the mayhem begins. And so, but let's take a break first. <laughs> Okay, 
Okay, we're back from the break. If you haven't become a patron of the podcast, do so now. Go to patreon.com. When you become a patron of the podcast, you get access to all of our other deep dives that are only available to patrons. So if you like the podcast and you want more of it, go to patreon.com, become a patron, and you'll get access to hundreds of patron-exclusive episodes. Plus, you'll potentially get swag and all that kind of stuff. So go to patreon.com become a patron. That's how I know whenever any, I, I get an email, every time someone becomes a patron <laughs> and, and there's not that many of you. And so w- every time someone becomes a patron, I'm like, Ooh, that's, you know, that's cool. Thanks for becoming a patron. Okay. So uh, let's go on here. Now I, I want to say something before moving on, which is that I am not justifying Charles Manson's behavior. Uh, just be, there's this weird reaction that I get sometimes from people that are saying, you know, whenever I uh, provide, I don't know, some some background or what I consider to be factors that led to someone's psychopathic, murderous behavior, some people will react and and say, you know, how dare you justify this person's behavior? They're just evil. There, there's a similar argument that happens in the Netflix show Mindhunter, you know, when the early FBI uh, profiling people or, or trying to figure out serial killers, what they called sequence killers back then. And there were uh, police officers and other people, and other FBI people who were saying, how dare you try to figure out these people? Um, you know, there's, there's no justification for what, for what they did. And to that, I say, yeah, you're right. There's, there's absolutely no justification for what they did. In terms of certain definitions of evil, yeah, it's he, Charlie Manson and his people did evil, evil things. Um, what is evil exactly? You know, I guess it depends on, on what we mean by that. But I don't know. According to most definitions of evil, yeah, Charlie Manson did evil things. Was he quote unquote evil? Uh, you could make an argument for that too. Uh, it, it, it doesn't justify it. It doesn't sympathize, you know, it doesn't, I don't, I, I hope you don't sympathize with what he did. The, the, the key factor in terms of um, this issue is there are thousands upon thousands of people who have the exact same background as Charles Manson, and the vast majority of those people never kill anyone. Yeah, and then some of them don't even hurt anybody. And so, uh, Charles Manson, his background doesn't cause his behavior because his background for the vast majority of people, it doesn't lead to what he what he eventually did. But what it does is it does provide factors that uh, contributed to the culmination of, of several other factors that led to what he did. And that's something that I learned upon learning more details about his story is that his story didn't have to end the way that it did. It ended the way that it did for a number of reasons, which which I'll you know hypothesize and get into. But but one of them is, and a major one is that his the way he was raised definitely created a personality that put him at risk at becoming the sort of person that he eventually became, and and the sort of behaviors that he exhibited later on. Okay, so. 1967. This is the summer of love. It's when uh, American youth society completely pivoted. It was a it was a very strange time. And as a uh, person who was obsessed with the 60s when I was uh, younger, uh, for a number of reasons, uh, but mainly because I I love the Beatles. If you know this podcast, you know that me and Umberto love the Beatles. And so I was, I was, I've watched, you know, just so many documentaries about the Beatles and the sixties and the summer of love and psychedelic rock and, and the drug culture and the, the beatniks and how that sort of was a precursor to all of this. And, and so, and I've watched countless uh, reenactments, you know, the doors and the stones and uh, Janis Joplin and, and Jimi Hendrix. And, and so it, it was, it was a very interesting time because the sixties were very close to the fifties, right? The, the, the fifties were, had a very, had an innocence to it. 
and there was an, a lot of American exceptionalism at the time in terms of we had emerged from World War II as a dominant force in the world. And for the first time, America was was really looked to as this beacon of hope and of economy and industry and and of freedom and of democracy and of uh, people being able to rise above their station, you know, and gl- the glitz and glamour of Hollywood and everything. Well, the '60s, you know, when when people were in the '60s, I don't I don't think they said wow, this is a completely different era. I think a lot of people in the 60s were like, well, you know, we're, we're still in that time. And then you have this, this clash of like, um, you know, civil rights movements and just all this, uh, you know, discussion around trying to change society to be even better. And the experimentation with drugs and music starts to, I mean, all you got to do is look at the Beatles and look at the, uh, from their first album to Sgt. Pepper's, there's only four years time. They go from I Want to Hold Your Hand to Sgt. Pepper's, uh, you know, being for the benefit of Mr. Kite and Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds and uh, Strawberry Fields Forever and all all those great uh, 67, 66 songs in the span of three or four years. That's how rapid the society was changing at the time. And so Charlie Manson emerges out of prison in, 19, in 1967, and he's in his early 30s at this point. And he actually had begged to stay in prison. He, he, he liked the stability of it. He said, you know, please, I beg you, please keep me in prison. You know, is there something you can do? So again, another sort of interesting little story here in terms of he knew he wasn't made for society. By that point, by his mid thirties, early thirties, he's like, I, I can't survive in the real world. Uh, some, uh, something's going to go wrong. And what this tells me is that he didn't have a lot of self esteem. He had tried through his ways to try to have a good life, and it, and every at every turn he was experiencing bad things. And he was like, please keep me in prison. I, I suspect that. He liked the routine. He liked the stability. He liked the fact that people had to be his friend. People had to hang out with him, right? Because he's he uh, he's stuck in this in this place with other people, and people can't get away from him, you know. And he caused problems in prison, but not that many problems back then. He caused a lot of problems later, but but anyway, they kicked him out anyway, obviously. And um, he he emerges into. He, you know, ground zero. I think he immediately goes to San Francisco, which is where a lot of people were going. He eventually made his way to LA as well because there was a lot of things happening in LA at the time. Um, you know, there at the time there was there were a lot of factors that created um, the the factors that led to Charlie Manson and his people doing what they did. There there were a lot of people at the time, a lot of young people at the time and this went into the 70s, who believed that violence was justified, that essentially terrorism, what we, what we might call domestic terrorism, was completely justified. There was just a ton of anger at the government, at Nixon, at LBJ, for not listening to reason and not listening to young people. And they were like, we need to get out of Vietnam. We're, we're, we're bombing and murdering innocent people. There were all these uh, news reports and pictures coming back from Vietnam of just these horrible atrocities that Americans were inflicting on innocent people. We, we were napalming villages with, with children in it, uh, with, with limited intelligence that, that it even mattered to do such a thing. We were carpet bombing entire regions of Laos and Cambodia and North Korea. And uh, we, we, I think we dropped, uh, there were, I think there were particular, I don't know, weeks that we dropped more bombs in the Vietnam War than we dropped in all of World War II. There's some stat about that. It just, it's like the amount of bombs, you know, when you think of the Vietnam, you think of like, you know, 
guys with mustaches going through the forest, you know, fighting the Viet Cong. And certainly there was that, but there was also just just tons and tons and tons of bombs that that Americans were, you know, making and transporting over and and then just indiscriminately at times just sort of trying to bomb the crap out of them. Because when you bomb, you don't risk American lives, right? But what bombs do is one they basically just make it so that the 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 enemy goes underground, which they literally did. They just built tunnels. And you end up killing all these innocent people. <laughs> and it's just, I don't know. So so that was one. Uh, but there were other things as well. Like there were economic problems and, of course, civil rights problems. And, and people, young people were saying, this is bullshit. And the, you had this, this policy among some police officers at the time where it's just like, look, if a crowd gets out of line, you have every right to beat the crap out of them, maybe even kill them. You know, that the at Kent uh, State University, there were uh, the National Guard was called and they, they just started shooting into crowds. Imagine that today. Imagine, you know, today we have uh, problems with police officers macing people, right? There's that there's that famous picture of that um, of that police officer just just macing the crap out of these college kids face and stuff. And, and there's a lot of outrage about that. Well, in the sixties, you had police officers and the national guard who's, which is an extension of the federal government, right? Just indiscriminately shooting into unarmed groups of people. Now, some of you will debate and say, well, Kent state, you know, there were shots coming from the crowd. I don't know. The point is, is that it was a very chaotic time in which youth were getting together into groups for various different purposes. They were saying, look, we can't depend on our society. We have to get together and we have to uh, do this on our own. We have to create communes, maybe even get away from society to uh, live our lives. And some of these groups were saying, look, we have to strike back. Uh, They're not listening to us. Our protests are not being heard. We have to, uh, you know, make them listen to us. And some of those people said, well, the only way to make them listen to us is, is through violence. Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, the debate between whether or not, so Malcolm X was, so Martin Luther King is like, look, peaceful, peaceful protest is the way we can win the hearts of America. If America sees, if, if middle white America, middle class America, uh, middle class white America sees us as uh, victims of uh, uh, the white oppressor, then the, the m- mainstream America will you know, come to our side and then that will win the day and the oppressive white forces will have to give in because white people will fight against them. Um, And Martin Martin Luther King is like, if we fight them with force, then the optics of it will look as though we deserve to be oppressed through violence and uh, we don't want that. And so Martin Luther King was a genius in that way. He learned from Gandhi and all this kind of stuff. Anyway, and to, and to a lot of extent, it really worked. Malcolm X had a different point of view. He was like, no, 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 no. Uh, that's bullshit because if someone comes to your house with a gun and threatens to shoot your family, you don't just sit down and, and have a sit-in and have a hung- hunger strike. You get a gun and you defend yourself. And so Malcolm X, I don't know if that's the exact, I don't know if he said that analogy, but that's the gist of what I get from Malcolm X. And, and Malcolm X would, you know, he would say, look, and the Black Panthers and all these people, they're like, look, we have to defend ourselves. And one way to defend ourselves is to militarize ourselves, essentially, and make the KKK and, and the p- white police force understand that, look, we're not going to come after you. But if you come after us, we're going to defend ourselves and we have guns because it's an American right to have guns. And actually the whole NRA, uh, you know, the amendment for guns rights uh, in a lot of ways became a constitutional disgust thing because of this issue of black people saying we get, okay, if, if it says in the constitution that everyone gets guns, then we get guns too. <laughs> and we, we can defend ourselves. So there was just a lot of talk around that, you know, at the time. And you can debate whether or not it was right or wrong or whatever. But the point is, is that Charles Manson emerges from prison, 1967, 
San Francisco, LA, Ground Zero, Watts riots, um, you know, all the civil rights protesting that was happening all the time. I mean, that's another thing that unless you grew up at the time or watched as many documentaries as I do, um, riots, young people rioting was like a regular occurrence. For example, I went to the University of Washington and uh, I was walking through this one administration building. I can't remember what it's called, shaped like a W. But anyway, I'm walking through uh, this building trying to find different offices. I think I was like paying tuition or something. And I was having a really hard time finding my way around. And at some point I turned to this random clerk and I says, why? I said, why is this building so confusing? It's almost like the doors are purposefully hard to find. And she says, well, yeah, actually that's how this building is designed. It's, it's designed to confuse people. And I was like, why in the world would you, would you design an administration building that's confusing to find your way around? And she says, well, this was built in uh, the late 60s, early 70s when riots on campus were a regular weekly event. And one of the things that the rioting students would do is they would raid the administration buildings. And so this building was designed one, so that when when the building was was invaded by its own student body in a violent manner, it, it would be hard for the students to find their way around so that it would limit the amount of damage they could do to a particular section of the building. Also, all the doors are set on this. There's a one button. All you have to do is press this one button. All the doors swing shut and lock. Also, there are some secret doors that only employees know about that if you need to get out of the building, then you own this this one door is actually really hard to find, even though it's just around this little corner. And so I was like, wow, uh, you know, we've never we haven't seen a time like that uh, in in my lifetime. Uh, I grew up in, you know, I went to college in, in the late 80s, early 90s. And and, you know, there's been protests for sure. And there's been violence for sure. And there's been. Uh, riots and blah blah blah. But imagine a university saying, "We need to build a build. We need to build our next building so that we so that we can protect ourselves from our own students, because <laughs> our because our own students are regularly raiding our own buildings and uh, harming uh, property and and harming people. And so um, it's just a very different time, a- and that needs to be considered when you think about what. Charles Manson was and and his people and what they did. There were small groups of people who were, uh, you know, like the Patty Hearst story is going to come out. And it, the Patty Hearst story to me is very similar to the Charles Manson story. There's There was this, um, there were all these little pockets of people who had charismatic leaders who were saying, look, we have to strike back. You know, this is a political organization. And 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 just very mismatched um, motives and and weird behaviors that, uh, but again, this is all before the internet and before uh, this had been explored very much in society. And so, uh, whenever anything sort of emerges, you're you're going to see some weird variations. Um, it's sort of like when life emerged on the planet. Uh, if you if you know early life on the planet, there was a huge variety of of morphology morphology. Uh, in the Cambrian, I think. Anyway, I'm getting into topics I don't know that much. Anyway, <clears throat> okay. So, uh, and also, uh, music and art was a big part of this overall vibe in the air in the late 60s around uh, anti-man, right? A- Anti-the-man and protest and rising up. You had Bob Dylan and, and the Beatles to some extent. You had the, the Doors and the Birds and Joan Baez and all these other, Crosby, Stills, Nash. You had all these people who were really a part of this and, and it, was, it, was, it was a huge vibe that in some ways has never happened again. You know, uh, there's, there's never been such a strong youth identity and strong youth um, togetherness to get something done as, as what happened in the sixties. Um, and the, the epicenters for these movements around the world was hate street or hate Ashbury and in San Francisco and, and sunset Boulevard or, uh, certain, there's certain regions of LA that were known for this and people were just flocking there 
to become part of this movement. You know, the Beatles, she's leaving home. Bye bye. Um, I left my heart in San Francisco or no, wait. Uh, if you come to San Francisco by, uh, uh, Mamas and the Papas. Anyway, lots of drugs, lots of sexual experimentation, because one of the things about this anti the man stuff was like, look, the man doesn't want us to have sex, so we're going to have sex. The man doesn't want us to use drugs, we're going to use drugs. The man doesn't want us to grow out our hair, we're going to grow out our hair. The man doesn't want us to wear uh, floppy clothes that smell bad, we're going to use floppy clothes that smell bad. And <clears throat> people were just flocking from all over the world, really. And just coming to LA and San Francisco and experimentation and art and just, and a, a lot of disaffected youth, right? So imagine you're going up in an abusive household and you want to run away. Well, you, you hear about this mecca of young people who everyone's giving to each other. And there was a lot of that. You, you could during this time, you know, just pick up and hitchhike your way to San Francisco or, or LA and find a lot of organized help for people. Now, it probably wasn't enough, but there was a lot of there's a lot of good things that were happening at the time. A lot of people saying, you know, look, let's do away with materialism, let's give to the community, let's recycle, let's blah blah blah. And uh, a lot of our, our, our American hippie, crunchy granola identity was born during this time. <clears throat> Um, you could say there's precursor to it, of course. But anyway, so all this is happening. There's also uh, a massive trend among young people to become an outlaw. You had movies that were trying to make money off this, like Easy Rider, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, Bonnie and Clyde. You know, people actually wanted to become outlaws. The, these movies weren't just like, oh, fun, uh, Bonnie and Clyde, go on this. You know, no, there there were people who were like, that's going to be me. I'm I'm going to rob from the rich and I'm going to give to the poor. Literally, that's what I'm going to do with my life. Out, out of protest for the Vietnam War, out of protest of the government, out of protest of the man. They were, they were just like, this is going to be my life. I'm going to, I'm going to go to LA and I'm going to meet up with other people and, and we're going to become actual outlaws. Now, 99.99% of the people never followed through with those visions, but it, it was definitely something in the air. There was a there was a sort of justified outlaw uh, motivation at the time, and a certain uh, sort of cheering of uh, the of a certain group of people for people who struck back, and and it, so it was a it was a very uh, it was a very difficult time and a very sort of uh, a scary time for middle America, right? For mainstream America, they're just like, oh my god, there's all these hippies running around doing God knows what. They're high on God knows what, and they're going crazy, uh, you know, and um, uh, what are they, are they going to kill all of us? <laughs> and then you have all these black people with guns and talking about that they want to kill whitey and uh, what's going to happen. There was just, they, you know, if you were in 1968 in America, there were a lot of, there was a lot of worries for a lot of things, nuclear war, race, actual race war between black people and white people, uh, economic collapse. And there was just no way for them to know that we were going to survive it. There was a lot of indication that America would not survive. Assassinations, you had JFK, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, um, Medgar Evers, uh, you had um, Bobby Kennedy. There was just all of this just holy – I mean, imagine our our president being shot and killed, and then just a couple – few years later – uh, his his brother, who was also running for president, also murdered. It's it's it it felt like, well, if the '60s are this bad, imagine that what the '70s are going to be like. Is any politician going to survive the '70s? There was just this. There was just a, it was a very scary time, and there and with that, a lot of opportunity for exploitation of human beings, right? Because when people are scared, they're they're very easily manipulatable. Um, okay, uh, the the last thing I'll say about '60s culture, um, and some of you might obviously know all these things. I know some of you are older than me and actually were there. <laughs> I, uh, patron Akemi actually comes to mind. I'm sure she'll she'll email me and say like, actually, I was 
I was in LA at the time, and and let me tell you my stories. And so I, you know, I welcome that because I, I love that kind of stuff. Um, also, at the time, the last thing here is that there were lots of talk about subliminal messages in rock music. Today, we don't really do it that much, but at the time, there was just a, a huge paranoia in society that rock music had secret messages in it for various different nefarious means. Uh, one being that it was going to uh, get in, that, that rock musicians were satan- satanic and they were trying to subtly influence youth through these bas- backmasking or subliminal messages that were trying to get kids to commit these horrible crimes. And there were cases actually in which a kid would do something terrible, kill someone, and then claim that a uh, you know a rock record had subliminal messages that that made them do it, and it was a viable defense. There was a, a case with um, a Judas Priest, I believe, in the early seventies, in which or mid seventies, in which um, that that defense was viable in court. It's like, yep, a rock musician, a satanic rock musician, caused me to kill that person. And today we don't think that way that much. I mean, we certainly have our weird things that we think today, but there, there, what, there's, there was a panic about that back then, and there was a lot, there was a lot of intrigue among youth. It's like, oh, you know, what are the? There's all these weird noises in the background of the Beatles records. What are they trying to say to us? You know, it was, it was basically assumed that the weird psychedelic noises that the Beatles were making were somehow like super genius, psychological, blah, blah, blah. When you actually inter- when you actually listen to interviews with John Lennon and Paul McCartney and George Harrison, Ringo Starr, but particularly J- uh, John Lennon, because John Lennon really liked all those background sounds, he'll say, no, that's not, <laughs> he'll just be like, actually, what I'm saying there is Oompa Loompa hit him in the Joompa <laughs> or something. There's this one, there's this one weird sound where you, it sounds like they're saying everybody smoke pot, everybody smoke pot. But in reality, it's, it's uh, John Lennon thought it'd be funny if everyone said something like Oompa Loompa hit him in the Joompa, just, just this weird kid phrase that he thought up and just thought it was hilarious. And that, that was a lot of what the Beatles did. They just like, wouldn't it be funny if we made this weird noise and then the public would interpret it as this secret message that was trying to, so, so all that, uh, it are, it, so keep all this weird sixties culture stuff in mind as we head into the Manson story, uh, which I will continue after the break. <laughs> All right, we're back from the break. This month's episodes of December 2017 are brought to you by Talkspace.com. That's Talkspace. Go to Talkspace, and if if you're looking for an online counselor, use the promo code Kirk, and you'll get a discount on your first month's fee. It's a pretty cheap way of getting counseling. Very convenient way of getting counseling because you don't have you don't have to go to anyone's office. You can you can chat with your counselor anywhere you want. And again, use the promo code Kirk to get a discount. And also, when you use the promo code Kirk, K I R K, it signals to Talkspace that you're one of my listeners, which means that they'll continue being a sponsor, which has uh, really been a big deal to us. Okay, so let's go on with the story here. So keep all that '60s culture in mind as we move forward, because <clears throat> it 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 explains a lot of weird elements of this story. Okay, so Manson emerged from prison. And he went straight to Hate Street, and he eventually went to L.A. as well. And his his, min- his mission, this was actually kind of new to me in terms of my semi-deep dive into this, is that his mission was to become a rock star. That's all he wanted to do. He, he was obsessed with the Beatles. He loved the Beatles. And the Beatles really inspired a lot of people. Whenever you hear anyone from that time, like, like Tom Petty, well, a lot of people back then, when they heard the Beatles, they're like, wow, or they saw the Beatles, they're like, wow, those guys are just regular guys playing music, writing their own songs, they're doing everything themselves, and you don't you don't need a big orchestra behind you, you just pick up these instruments and you, and you make it work. Well, Manson was one of those people that uh, he was inspired to be like, hey, pick up a guitar, write some music, and you, know, you can become a rock star. And so Charlie Manson, that was his mission. You could even say that was his mission until uh, everything fell apart at the end. It was just like he just he wanted to be a rock star, and he why did he want to be a rock star? Uh, hard to know, but 
uh, I think it's because he, he wanted people to love him. I think that was a big thing. I think that he grew up being unloved and he was desperate for love and he, he didn't think he could be loved in a normal way. And so I think he thought, well, if I become a rock star, uh, then everyone will love me. So this also exhibits some of his narcissism in terms of believing that he could be a rock star. Um, and so he picked up a guitar and started writing music. You can actually listen to his music online. Some of it is not actually that bad, particularly when you um, isn't that bad. Some, some of it's kind of good. Uh, particularly, I would say his voice is actually kind of good. It, it, it's When I hear his singing voice, I'm like, that singing voice comes out of that face. It doesn't make any sense uh, because his face doesn't look like a pretty voice would come out of it, and it's it's kind of a pretty voice, and his his um, his lyrics aren't terrible, but his melodies are kind of interesting. He has a he had a, as a songwriter myself, he has an interesting he has an interesting melody um, creativity. His guitar playing is awful. I just have to say, <laughs> he he's always he always has a guitar in the, you know in the background acoustic guitar and it's just it's it's i don't know what he's trying to do on guitar honestly i hear the guitar in the background i'm just like what are you trying to do there it's almost like he used guitar as as a percussion instrument in some ways and not really as a melodic instrument but anyway um his his music wasn't it wasn't all that bad and uh there's a whole huge story here with the beach boys and neil young and all these other people but basically the long and the short of it is is in LA, he 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 figured out ways to uh, network his way into the lives of famous people, particularly the drummer for uh, the Beach Boys, Dennis Wilson, who's the brother of Brian Wilson, the, who is the main creative force of the Beach Boys, but not the only. Um, so so he wormed his way into their lives, and uh, and he. He did this through a number of different ways. One ways, one of the ways is he he always had great drugs with him. He always just had a ton of drugs. He also had a, a sort of cadre of of women around him, who he young women, who he would basically pimp out. He had by this so basically he started uh, after leaving prison. He immediately started trying to get a harem together. And he started using these these skills of you know how to how to influence people, the pimp skills, and his own psychopathic skills. He 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 figured out how to manipulate young vulnerable women. He would lie to them, saying that he was connected with famous people. He would he would intimidate them and sort of scare them, and then he would actually beat them when they when they disobeyed him. And he would preach to them. This is something he learned while in a church as a, as a kid with his, I think with his grandma. And he, over time, built this, this small group of, of young women, uh, you know, three or four women, who he, he basically got them to do whatever, um, he, he, was, he was in complete control of their lives. And they became basically brainwashed by Charlie Manson and slowly, uh, and so Charlie Manson would figure out, he's like, okay, um, he would test girls out. He would he would figure out who's manipulatable and who's not. And then once he figured out, oh, okay, this is some, this is someone with an abuse history who um, will be easily manipulatable. And then he would get them. So so once he had this small group of women, he would use them in ways that would sort of suck other men into his cir- circle. And so one of the ways was he would tell them to dance around naked all the time. <laughs> Um, so there's, he was always telling everyone to be naked. Another thing was, is he would actually tell them, look, I want you to go have sex with Dennis Wilson and do whatever he wants. And and the girls would be like, okay, we'll do whatever you want because they were so, um, you know, uh, brainwashed and, or just, you know, in love with Charlie Manson and his charismatic thing, you know? So at this point, Charlie Manson isn't a murderer, right? He, or at least as far as we know, at this point, so there's another whole thing in the 60s culture that I didn't talk about in terms of gurus. There was this huge thing around uh, gurus, uh, gurus from India, gurus from other places, where it was basically you had this um, emergence of 
this culture around like you have to find a guru to follow and you have to find a wise person to follow. I, I, you know, there's all sorts of sort of analysis about this because people in the sixties, they grew up in church in all likelihood. And so there was this, this ingrained notion that you had to have some charismatic leader that you followed. And if it wasn't going to be Christianity, then you had to find something else. And so there were all these uh, gurus in the late 60s or early 70s in uh, California, particularly, who would rise up, who would just have these this instant group of super loyal followers. And a lot of the tenants were the same. It'd be like, give away your possessions, love your neighbor, you know, these kinds of things. And and uh, Charlie Manson was one of those guys. He he was he was like he was anti capitalism. He was pro uh, you know giving to each other. Um, there's a famous story in which he uh, was preaching his stuff about not um, caring about your possessions to uh, people on this beach, and this guy walked by and heard it and was like, "Ah, this guy's bullshit." And he says, "Okay, pal, if you think if if you're that." Um, unattached to your possessions, you know, you guys came here in this fancy bus. I see that you have this bus that's like all outfitted with bells and whistles and stuff. Um, how about you just give me that bus? How about you just give away, you know, that bus? If, you know, if, if you're true to your word, you're, you'd give me that bus, right? And Charlie Manson thought for a second, he says, yep, you're right. And he just threw him the keys said, here's the bus. It's yours. And the guy actually drove off in the bus, and but then later came back with the bus and said, "Okay, I, I don't want this bus, but you know, you proved your point, pal." And so Charlie Manson, you know, he was he was. Uh, you could imagine, again, you're from Indiana and you run away from home and you go to L.A. and you're you know meeting people and you don't have any friends, and then all of a sudden you meet this small group of people who are talking about giving to each other and they're talking about uh you know social change and they're talking about uh throwing away your material possessions and being good to your neighbor and all this kind of stuff and you're just like huh you know this sounds kind of cool um can i join your group and they're like they're like sure man you know but uh you got to give away your stuff to us and we're we're all going to share and we're all going to work together and we're all going to you know there's a there's a very compelling message there that that is that is moral that you could imagine people getting on board with and so charlie manson had that um and he also was a scary individual he he was there were a lot of gurus that were great and nice people um manson was a a scary type guru (laughs) and an intimidating bullyish guru and a narcissistic well maybe all the gurus were narcissistic uh but he was particularly narcissistic. Um, and so so that's another sort of element that explains why people would flock to him. Because in my estimation today, if if Charlie Manson emerged from uh, you know prison today and went to LA, he wouldn't be able to get a following the way that he did because people today just don't have that notion, like find a guru to follow. Plus, people understand cults much better today than they did back then. Anyway. Uh, people certainly still join cults today, but I think I think it's a little harder. Anyway, um, so so he would go to these rich people and these parties, and he and Manson would just say, "Okay, you know these three girls who are following me have sex with that man," and and so he he did that a lot, and and that um, helped him to um, stay in power, and is one of the elements as to why I think we still talk about Charlie Manson because it, it has sex in it. And even if you have sex and murder, then it's instantly talked about. Okay. So at this point, it seems to me anyway, that he, he didn't want to be a killer or even necessarily a cult leader. It seemed he wanted to be a rock star who was a, a adored by fans. All of his networking efforts were trying to get him into the music industry. That's why he approached uh, Wilson of the Beach Boys is because he's like, well, oh my God, the Beach Boys, you know, the Beach Boys were one of the biggest bands in the world at the time. And he was like, okay, if I get in good with the Beach Boys, then that I can get connected. And and he did a lot of that. Um, and in many ways, he was just like thousands of other people who came to LA and San Francisco at the time to be a rock star. 
you know, it, it's it's easy to look at this story and say like, oh, you know, he's evil and he's like working his way in because eventually he's going to create havoc and kill a bunch of people. No, when I hear the story, there's no way to t- differentiate Manson at this point from really any other person who came to L.A. to uh, become a rock star. And that that was his mission. He 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 wrote music and he was like for a, for a long time that that's all he was focusing on was getting to know famous musicians, getting connected with record companies, getting connected with producers, trying to get his songs recorded, trying to get people to listen to it. Um and at the same time there were reports that he would try to intimidate people. Uh, for instance, he would go into the recording studio because eventually the Beach Boys, Neil Young, other people uh, did manage to get him into the studio, and uh, which is a big deal. But he in the studio he could he couldn't stand people telling him what to do. And when you when you go into the studio as a musician myself, when you go into the studio, you 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 are not the star anymore. The engineer and the producer is the star, and you have to. I mean, not the star per se, but you're not the one in control. <laughs> you're entering someone else's realm, and they understand everything. They understand how the microphones work. They understand how the headphones work. They understand how the board works. They understand how the you know, it's their world, and you're recording your music in their world. You know, and you as a musician have to hand over control to the producers and the engineers and you have to say, um, please help me. There's a lot of, you feel very defense, uh, you feel very um, powerless when you are in someone else's studio. And, and for myself, I like that because I understand that their expertise is so far beyond mine when it, when it, when it comes to recording equipment that I de- really depend on them to, to help me out. And so there's a lot of times where you're just sitting around doing nothing, waiting for an engineer to figure out how to place a microphone or something. Well, Charles Manson hated that. He hated the engineers being in control of things. And he would, because of his issues regarding control and the abuse he's been through, he would uh, become threatened by that and he would attack the engineers. And so there's all there's stories of him just being a complete asshole to these engineers. Um, he would make subtle threats to people, like even to Dennis Wilson. He he would say, well, you know, once he kind of wormed his way into his life, he's, he, he basically implied, look, uh, I, I really want you to help me. And, you know, if you don't help me, I, I can't promise that I'm not going to flip out and do something terrible. So Charlie Manson used that a lot. He sort of threw out little threats you know, subtle threats and sometimes blatant threats to other people, uh, trying to get them to, to, you know, come under his control. Um, and there are various ways that people react against that, right? When, when, if you've ever been, it's sort of similar to the Harvey Weinstein situation. It's, you know, when someone presents behavior that is unexpected or threatening to you in some way, because for a lot of people, being threatened is actually a very rare thing. They being, you know, the, the sense that someone is a threat, a physical threat is actually for some people very rare. And, and for most of us, it's very rare, hopefully. And it's not. And so it's hard to think through those situations. It's hard to think straight during those situations. And we have four different reactions that we uh, have available to us in terms of our evolution. We have fight or flight, right? That's two, or freeze or appease. So you have fight or flight or freeze or appease. And we all know what fight is, right? So so when Charlie Manson would make these subtle threats, he figured out, he would sort of test people, right? And so he would he would make a subtle threat and some people would be like, you know, would 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 come at him strong and be like, you know, what did you say? And Charlie Manson, when he didn't have power, uh, or just wasn't in that mode yet would would probably say, oh, okay, well, I can't intimidate this guy because his his response is to to come out aggressive, and I don't want that in my life. So he would he would ignore that person. Another sort of person would would flee, right? Um, the uh, one of the other guys in the Beach Boys, uh, the the guy who wears the Beach Boy hat all the time. <laughs> What's his name? 
uh, I forget his name, but anyway, he, in an interview, talked about how Manson tried to threaten him to stay. Uh, to to he was uh, in a sense, you could say Manson was sort of testing to see if this other Beach Boy could be um, intimidated. And what he did is is he was like, oh my god, this guy's scary, and he just he just fled. He just says he's like, I'm I'm getting out of here, and I'm never coming back here again. Um, so that's flight. Uh, then you have freeze, which is deer in headlights, right? You just sort of freeze. Uh, there's that response. And then there's appease. So this is the one that Charlie Manson was looking for. There is a, a reaction that people will do. And, and you hear this in the Charlie, uh, or not the Charlie, but the Harvey Weinstein stories is we, as a defense mechanism against threat, will sometimes choose to appease people. We'll, we'll be like, okay. You know, you just, it's a way of managing danger. If you can get someone to calm down and if you can make someone believe that you are on their side, then there's a very real reduction in threat. And it works sometimes, you know, it really works to our advantage sometimes, you know, like say, I don't know, um, somebody, uh, you get into a fender bender and someone jumps out of the car and they're like um, real aggressive, and they're they're shaking, and they're very upset, and they they want to fight you. And you get out of the car, and you're like, hey, 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 I get it, man. I'm sorry. Even though you're thinking, not my fault <laughs> that we got this fender better. But anyway, at first you're just, hey, hey, I get it, man. I you know, maybe it was my fault. I don't know. Um, and I'm really sorry that that happened. I'm you know, so so you're trying to appease the other person, even though in your mind you're thinking. Uh, one, this wasn't necessarily my fault, and two, why are you being aggressive? Like, calm down. So, so there's a very uh, functional uh, part to the appease part. Um, particularly, we learn the appease bit when we're very young, a lot, often at times, because when you're five, ten years old, you you don't have the power to fight, and you don't have the power to flight. And if you freeze, you know that's one thing. So. Uh, so, so people who can't fight or flight will sometimes either freeze or appease. And so that's what Charlie Manson was looking for was he would make a subtle threat. And he, and if the person moved to appease, he was like, okay, this is the sort of person I want in my circle because I can control them. So he, he, he was a, when, when I review all this stuff and all this happened before the murders, right? So at this point, he, he's just he's just a bully. And when I hear all this stuff, uh, going back into his early childhood, m- my assessment is that he's a full-on psychopath. He is a full-on psychopath. Um, he is narcissistic. He's manipulative. He's manipulative. He's, he likes to intimidate people. He's, a, he's self-entitled. He's self-grandiose. He's cruel to people. He doesn't have a shred of empathy for other people just like his parents were and just like they taught him to be. Okay. So there's a lot of interesting twists and turns of the story at this point in terms of um, his music, uh, tra- his early uh, sp- sort of sputtering music career. Um, but at one point, the Beach Boys actually recorded one of his songs. I mean, this was one thing I was like, what? <laughs> there is a Beach Boy song written by Charlie Manson. <laughs> now, um, Manson, uh, you could say for the most part, only wrote the lyrics because the Beach Boys, by the time the Beach Boys got a hold of the melody, they changed it quite a bit, but it's similar. It's actually, the song is called Never Learn Not to Love. And the drummer brought it to the band uh, without mentioning uh, that Manson wrote the lyrics, probably because um, Brian Wilson so Brian Wilson had actually met Manson and hated him. And so the drummer, I believe his name was Dennis Wilson, brought the lyrics to the band hoping to record the song and either said that either, either you know, he and he failed to say it was written by Charlie Manson. And that was either because Brian Wilson um, uh, would not have recorded it if he knew it was written by Charlie Manson or Dennis Wilson, the drummer, just wanted to take credit for something. Um, well, so after this, Charlie Manson was furious, legitimately. I mean, imagine you write a song and you spend all this time 
and you're desperately trying to break into the music biz and then this this famous guy just rips you off so so this is sort of the beginning of charlie manson's emerging anger so remember that anger that he had when he was a young kid where he gathered gathered up all of the toys and burned them you know there's a there's when you're hurt and you feel betrayed there's a there's an anger response and then there's a revenge impulse okay so at this point he starts going full cult because i think he's realizing i can't break into the music biz in the normal way i i've been i've been at it for a long time i've gone to the studio a number of times i've i've networked neil young loves me and and yet i can't i can't get a record deal the beach boys are ripping me off like i think at this point he's he's becoming disillusioned with the music business so this is when he starts seeing famous people in this other light of like they're all cutthroat they they're all you know they don't deserve uh, what they have this kind of stuff and so at this point he starts going full cult um it's unclear ex- exactly why maybe he's like uh Maybe I should focus less on the music part. Maybe maybe this cult thing is 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 going to work out for me. And so he starts gathering more and more followers. So it's not just a small cadre of of young women, but it he starts gathering a lot of people, men and women. And eventually he has 35 followers. And it's a real typical cult at this point. He gives sermons. It's there's a there's a commune feel to it. He gets to have sex with whoever he wants, he, and he does. He has sex with uh, his you know followers all the time. Uh, they start in, introducing race into it. There's a lot of anti-Semitism and a lot of talk about uh, black-white relations. He starts talking about how he might be Jesus, or he's he's like sort of like Jesus. There's a lot of talk about that. Whenever anyone enters the cult, he says, you know, you got to hand over all your possessions. You got to reject all your previous relationships, including your parents. And when people step out of line, he makes subtle threats to them. And and the followers start uh, sort of uh, threatening outsiders as well. Because, you know, there's this, there's this, w- when you enter a cult, you, you probably come from a difficult background yourself, but not always. And you, there's a, there's a, there's a cognitive mechanism that kicks in that tries to justify your decision. And one of the ways that you do that is to completely adopt the cult dogma. And you're, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a, uh, it, it becomes a part of who you are. You, the cult dogma becomes you, you become the dogma and you no longer have an independent way of thinking about things because whenever you do have an independent thought, it actually works against you given the the social context that you're in. And he also starts to militarize them. And there's a lot of twists and turns to this story, but um, he starts to train them on um, guns and knives. And it's, you know, it's sort of a late sixties version of all that kind of stuff. Also uh, he loves the Beatles again. And he he loved Sgt. Pepper's. He loved Magical Mystery Tour. He he would play the records during his sermons or after his sermons, and everyone would dance around naked. It was the Beatles were like a big part of the cult. Well, when the White Album comes out, and I've talked about this album before, it um, it's uh, perhaps aside from Rubber Soul and Revolver, White Album is definitely a favorite of mine, and. When the White Album came out in 1968, he played it for the cult. And he said that, so at this point, he, and he would give everyone LSD too. This is another thing, is he would, he would either secretly dose them with LSD or he would, you know, just say, hey, now's the time where we take LSD. And then he would give his sermons. When you do that, it causes a, uh, anyone who's taken LSD knows that there's a certain, uh, there's a, there are times when you take LSD and you feel very spiritual. You feel very, you know, one with the universe, very connected to people. Well, imagine if a charismatic leader were to give this compelling sermon at the time about how, uh, you know, we are one with the universe and that death has no meaning and that we are all one together as a group and that uh, the we're our mission in life is to make the world a better place. Like you can imagine that, that would really get under your skin, you know? So anyway, they would, 
he he would play uh, the White Album when it came out, and he would give people LSD, and he would say that the Beatles were actually channeling his message, and he he made it seem like he he told them all, look. I have evidence that the Beatles know about us and that they are writing these songs specifically for us and they're trying to give us a message. So remember all that 60s culture stuff around like secret messages and all that kind of stuff. And and he had some coincidences in the on the record that uh, was evidence that the Beatles knew about him. Uh, the Beatles did not write White Album for Charlie Manson. <laughs> I mean, I just want to say that up front in case you were wondering, but... Um, it's debatable if they even knew who he was. Um, you know, I, I don't think they knew even who he was. And even if they did, why would they care? So, um, but to his cult followers, this made him seem like a rock star, like he always wanted to be, right? So if he couldn't become a rock star legitimately by actually creating music that people wanted to listen to, he could become a rock star by basically uh, convincing his his cult followers that he was basically like, a god to the Beatles, you know, like the Beatles looked up to him as what he was saying. And he twisted the lyrics and he, he, there's this, uh, there's a song by George Harrison, Little Piggies. And it's basically about class um, and about how rich little piggies and, you know, they eat their blah, blah, blah. And so that became a part of the, um, a sort of a, a call to arms for the Manson people in terms of like, we have to bring down the rich. And he also, there's a lot of black white stuff that he would talk about, you know, the, the song Blackbird and revolution, revolution nine happiness is a warm gun and helter skelter. All these songs he said was the Beatles way of saying that they wanted Charlie Manson and his followers to start a race war. So again, civil rights and, race relations in the United States was a very hot topic at the time. And remember, we have Malcolm X, we have, uh, you know, we have Martin Luther King, we have the assassination of Martin Luther King, assassination of Medgar Evers and blah, blah. You you just have like a lot of tension between black people and white people at the time. Not just like in today's world, we have tension, but back then the tension was so much, uh, it was different. Let's just put it that way. And there were, legitimate worries that there would be pockets of civil wars, you know, like, um, like all the black people in LA getting guns and just roaming the streets and killing white people. Now there was no movement to do that. And there was no way that was going to happen, but white people definitely thought that was a possibility. And so there, and so this cult, uh, would the people in this cult wouldn't have been any different from society. And, you know, now that I think about it, I don't think there was a single black person in Manson's family. They called it the family, by the way. So it was another way of sort of keeping everyone together. And so there, one of the major themes was that Charlie Manson was like, what the Beatles want us to do is they want us to be the spark that, you know, begins the race war between black people and white people. We want, and we want that. We want black people to rise up and kill all the white people. And, and, and so, so because of that fear, right? So imagine it. So let me try to uh, bring an analogy. So, you know, there's a lot of fear right now about Muslims in America, right? There's a, there's a fear that uh, Muslims will kill us, right? In America, Um, even though empirically uh, that's just the chance of being killed by a Muslim is, far uh, uh, more unlikely than being killed by a Christian in America. But anyway, um, so there's this fear. There's this panic, right? There's uh, particularly among certain people in, in America right now. There's a panic around <gasps> Muslims. They want to kill us. Okay. Uh, sh- you know, Sharia law or whatever the fuck, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, sorry, I swear. I'm trying not to swear anymore. Um, so uh, there's all this panic around that. Well, imagine if... Um, someone came along and said like, look, it's going to happen. There's signs and, and he, you know, we have nine 11, you have this killing, you have this law, you have ISIS. It's happening. It is happening. And, and I know when it's going to happen because I'm actually connected with um, the people who 
who know ISIS and all that stuff. Like I have inside information that tells me that this is this has happened real fast. So imagine like you have a charismatic person, LSD, um, no internet, you know, and not a lot of uh, trust in in newspapers at the time. And you're isolated and you just have someone just feeding you all this information. It's coming. The Muslims are going to, they're going to rise up. They're going to, they're going to kill us. ISIS is, you know, they're going to figure out a way to get into every airplane and they're going to drive every airplane into the ground. I mean, after 9-11, certainly that was a concern, right? You had the anthrax thing, you know, just all this, this terror. And now imagine you have a, a cult, you know, it's today, 2017, and and the the charismatic leader is like, look, we might as well just get this thing started because eventually it's going to happen. Eventually in America, there's going to be a war between Muslims and, you know, non-Muslims. It's going to happen. But, uh, and uh, America deserves it because of capitalism and the way it treats its poor and, you know, uh, the way it's been raping the, um, the environment and, and all this stuff like America deserves it. So imagine you have people that believe that. Okay. Then imagine that the, the leader says, and I, because I have a connection with Muslims, I can protect us from being killed by the Muslims because if, if we as non-Muslims prove our worth to the Muslims, then they, they will pass over us and kill everyone else, but not us. So that's what Manson was saying. It was like, we as white people, um, th- you know, this, this race war is inevitable and the Beatles are saying it's, it's going to happen. And we, so if we're, if we're the ones who spark it and begin it and get it going, then the black people, when they actually do rise up, they won't kill us because we, because we have demonstrated we are on their side. That's what he was saying. And that became a very real thing to this cult. Now, there's debate as to whether or not Charlie Manson actually believed this. And according to my read of, of the story, I don't think Charlie Manson believed it at all. I think it was just another way for him to, it was just another way that he figured out how to, you know, keep his group galvanized. You know, there's, there's, um, a lot of power when you make people afraid of war and when you make people afraid of a particular ethnic group. We see this happen all the time. Trump did this. Um, Hitler did this. Not, not that I'm saying Trump is Hitler. I'm just saying there are figures in history who will demonize a particular group or make the, the, their followers afraid of a future war and by doing this, you get control over them. You get control when you, when, you, when you say, look, you are threatened by this outside group, but I have a way of protecting you. That's a very compelling message, right? And so Manson did that. Okay, so uh, this is all building up to the terribleness, and let's take a break. And when we get back, we'll continue it. <music> All right, we're back from the break, just continuing the story here. So at this point, Charlie Manson has a full-blown cult. He is, he is, He's isolating these people. They live on like some kind of ranch of some sort, and they're a commune. They're working together. He you know, gives them LSD, does sermons. He's having sex with all the women. And then... Um, a very quick uh, sequence of things start to happen. And there's a lot of little details here, but in, in a nutshell, he, he, Manson, I think started to realize, so this is in 69, uh, summer of 69. He, uh, I think he's starting to realize that he's losing control over his group essentially, or he's not always going to have control over his group or something. You know, eventually they're going to run out of money or eventually they're going to get caught by the cut because they were, they were doing all these petty crimes to get money. You know, like I think they were stealing cars or something and things are starting to escalate. And and it's, and so he's he also it has a lot of drugs, right, because there's a lot of drugs in this group. And so he's he he's trying to 
deal drugs and get drugs, and there's all these drug deals. And there's a, a drug deal that went bad. Some, you know, I forget the exact details, but some some guy um, threatened to hurt Manson, uh, you know, t- because of a drug deal gone bad. And Manson shot him, but didn't kill him as a way of, you know, pre- preemptively getting a guy before he gets you. You know, at the time, they're getting messed up with like, the, they were messed up with like the Hells Angels and like some other scary people. And so, so I think um, that sort of influenced things. And so I think that was the spark, was a drug deal gone bad, Manson preemptively trying to get rid of someone before they got rid of him. And I think, and very quickly things spun out of control from there. There's another bad drug deal that happens in the same month of July, 1969. And Manson and his family actually did kill a guy because of it. So at this point, Manson is like, oh my God, me and my cult, we're now, resp- he, th- he thought he killed the first guy. I don't, I don't think he did. But at this point, he's like, holy crap, July 19- 1969, me and my followers are now responsible for murder. And it's only a matter of time before someone talks about this to the wrong person, and then we're all going to go to jail. And, um, you know, holy crap, I've, we've crossed the line. And so at this point, I think Manson's like, okay, m- you know, time to self-destruct, essentially. <laughs> and you see this happen all the time in these cult leaders, you know, um, the Waco, Texas, and um, the the one in L.A. where they all had – uh, Adidas outfits on. <laughs> I can't remember the the name of that cult, but there's often this cult behavior where the leader suddenly realizes, "Oh my God, um, things are coming to an end. Things are unraveling." Okay, you know, uh, Jamestown. Uh, you know, you just have this 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 panic in the leader of just like uh, the police are coming for me, and um, my days are numbered, and so. Uh, I might as well go out with a with a bang, you know. I might as well uh, really make this thing uh, fully realized, you know. What what? How far can I take my power? If I'm gonna go to jail, I might as well, you know, make this thing as big as possible. If if, if I'm gonna go to the electric chair, I might as well do a lot of damage. And you see, spree killers do the same thing, right? They they're like, well, I want to kill myself. And wouldn't it be nice if I took a lot of people down with me? So how many people can I kill just before I kill myself? It's, it's a very terrible impulse. It just doesn't make any sense. Uh, and it's, it caused a lot of damage in the world. But anyway, so now you could say it plays into his narcissism, right? It's like, I want to be, you know, the, the most um, terrible person that's ever lived. I don't know. I, I think that he started to kind of go in that direction. But anyway. So then, August 1969, so just a a month after the two drug deals that went bad, he decides that he he really wants to start the race war now. And again, it's hard to know if Manson thought the race war would actually happen. Um, I I think that a part of him thought maybe it would, but I don't think he was fully on board with it anyway. At least if he did, it's like, how stupid can he be? But anyway... So in August 1969, he sends his people to the house of Sharon Tate and Roman Polanski. If you know Sharon Tate, Roman Polanski, then you know what I'm talking about. If you don't, you know, look him up. But anyway, he basically, he knew of this house because he had visited it before when he was trying to be a rock star. And he just, he knew the ad. He's just like, I know in this one house, there are famous people. I don't really know who they are, but I, I know there are famous people who live in this house. And, um, and I think what Manson was thinking was by killing everyone in this, in this famous person's house, two things will happen. One is, is I can get my revenge on famous people who have it all. You know, they, they have everything I want. They have, they have money, they have power, they have good looks. And, and the most important thing that they have that I want is like the uh, love from, from society. You know, they, they are loved by society and, and I hate them for that. And so I'm going to get my revenge on them for that. And now he didn't say that to his followers. What he said was, we need to get back at rich people because 
they're the enemy, they're the man, right? The other reason why he wanted to kill these people was because he knew it would be a big media sensation. If he killed a bunch of poor people, he knew that the media wouldn't pay attention to it. If he killed famous people, he knew the media would pay attention to it. And so he wanted there to the, he wanted the crime to look as though black people had killed them because he thought that the media would perceive it as the beginning of a race war, right? So he sends his people over there. They, they kill uh, six people, including Sharon Tate. Roman Polanski was in Europe at the time. Uh, it's a, it's a terrible grisly um, story. If you want it, details on that, just Google it. But um, his followers who there was Tex, who was this guy and he was, he had, I think three of the um, Manson young women with him. And uh, it was, it was a very haphazard crime. Uh, it's, it's, it's incredible that they, they didn't get caught. Um, it's, um, it, it's, it's a horrible, horrible story. But anyway, they kill six people in this, in this house including Sharon Tate, who, who was extremely pregnant at the time. Like she was probably due weeks later, you know, just a few weeks later. And they try to make it look like black people had done it by um, doing a, they, they took blood and wrote stuff on the walls and they, they were trying to make it look like um, black people had done it. <laughs> and, um, and then the next day, of course, you know, hits the news, blah, blah, blah. And, the people on the news, none of them are talking, of, none of them are speculating that black people did it. In fact, the cops, when they came, they were like, they started to try to piece it together. Like, well, it can't, it's probably not black people because this, this neighborhood is so devoid of, of black people and so scared of black people that we would have heard of reports of, uh, from neighbors saying there are black people in the neighborhood. And we didn't hear any reports last night of that. So it must have been white people and it must have been someone that they trusted because how did they get in the house and how did they, how did they round them all up and blah, blah, blah. And so, so Charlie Manson's upset by this. He's like, wait, so I thought, you know, I thought this was supposed to spark the race war that I was hoping would happen. I mean, I think part of it was, you know, actually I'm thinking of another motivation for Manson at this point of like, he's thinking, well, if, if I roll the lottery and the race war does start, then maybe my crimes that I've committed with those two drug deals gone bad and now Sharon Tate and the others with, when the race war happens, maybe it'll obscure my crimes and then I'll, I won't get caught. Or even if it does come out that no one will care because we'll be in the midst of a huge, huge race war happening where black people are killing white people and vice versa. Um, so maybe anyway, but there's a huge media circus at this point. A lot of people uh, who grew up at the time remember when they heard of this of this event in August of 69 of this slaughter that happened in this house. So um, so Manson's upset and he's like, okay, well, they're, they're not getting the picture. They don't realize it's black people. They, you know, none of them are getting the bait that it's black people killing these people. And so the next, the next day he's like, okay, we got to do it again. And so they go to this other house and they kill two more six, they kill two more rich people. And they really try to make it look like it was the Black Panthers this time. They're really trying to, you know, uh, paint the clues. Um, okay. Uh, there's a lot of twists and turns to that story as well. But the media doesn't, again, doesn't really pick up on the Black Panther clues. And so at this point, uh, I think Manson is starting to really panic. And the family is starting to kind of freak out too because – Although some of the people in the family were uh, notable psychopaths, um, th many were not. And many were like, wait, I did not join this cult to murder people. <laughs> um, like Charlie Manson, when he, he actually, when he sent the, the first group of people to Sharon Tate's house, the only person who really, who knew that there was going to be something terrible happening was Tex. I can't remember his last name, but... Um, that was his nickname text. And the three women that went with him had no idea that they were going there to kill anyone. And, and once they were there, they just kind of went along with it. And so, so at this point, I think Mance is thinking, Oh, you know, I, I'm losing control. What if the cops come after us? Blah, blah, blah. So he actually picks up moves to the desert 
And he he had been talking about in his prophecies about this hole that was in the ground that was going to like, I, I can't remember the exact details, was going to save them. So like they're going to find a hole in the desert and they're going to jump in it and be saved or something. I don't know. And so uh, while they're out in the desert out here, the, the cops are investigating these murders they, and they have no connection to the Manson people. They're... In a lot of ways, if Manson and his people just would have laid low, they would have got away with it because there were, the police were not looking in the direction of the Manson people. But they're out there, and again, it's a commune and blah, 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 and some, Manson becomes suspicious that one guy is going to rat them out, and so he kills that guy, so that's another murder. Um, and there's speculation about several other murders that they all committed that um, might be um, unknown to us, but anyway... But again, they don't have a way of making money and they need food and they're starving. And so they start stealing cars and um, uh, they get arrested for that. But again, they're, they're, they're not being implicated in, in, the, um, in the murders in LA. Eventually, one thing leads to another. And in a very haphazard way, the police fig- start thinking, huh, maybe this Charlie Manson guy and his people have done some bad things. And so they... They round them up, they investigate, people start talking, and then there's a trial. It's a media sensation. Manson, uh, when he poses for pictures, you know, these iconic sort of crazed eyes that he has, he has this way of, it, it's weird. When you look at all the pictures of Charlie Manson, there, there are younger pictures of him um, where he looks, he looks like a nice guy. He looks like a cute kid. Even when he was in his hippie phase, you could say, oh, that guy looks, you know, he looks, uh, he's, he's right on the borderline between like a nice hippie and an evil uh, villain. <laughs> it's like this weird, anyway, so America was riveted by this whole story. Mainstream America saw this as evidence that hippies were, were bad and evil because, you know, mainstream America was not hippie culture. This is, you know, um, long hair and bell bottoms. It was crazy. And it was terrifying for mainstream America to learn that these privileged white kids were doing these terrible, terrible things. And particularly these young women, these wafy, you know, 22 year old women doing horrific, horrific crimes. It it was a very scary time again, because match that up with all the other scary things, all the riots and all the college stuff. And then and mainstream America is terrified of college students doing all these terrible things. And all of a sudden you have this sensational story of what, what looks to be just, just college kids, college age kids uh, going into homes and brutally murdering all these people and, you know, taking their blood and writing stuff on the walls. It, it just sounded like the end of the world, you know, to people. Okay. So eventually Manson and his people, they go to prison, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of twists and turns that story. But anyway, so then begins the obsession with Manson. Because uh, at this point, he becomes known, obviously, to the world, particularly to Americans. And there's a bunch of movies that have been made that have depicted similar situations, um, probably inspired by the Manson murders. Uh, movies like I Drink Your Blood and The Night God Screamed. This is at the time, so in the late 60s, early 70s, or probably early 70s, I guess, sort of B-movies, you know, Death Master, um, Terror on the Beach, and The Love Thrill Murderers. You know, it was, America became kind of fascinated with this idea of like sex and murder and and um, drugs. And it, 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 it was a very interesting story back then. Um, famous people would talk about him. For instance, John Lennon said, I don't know what I thought when it happened, I just think a lot of things he says are true. That he's a child of the state made by us, that he took their children in when nobody else would. But of course, he's cracked, all right? He's barmy. I don't know what barmy means. I'm guessing it means like crazy or something. So here you have John Lennon saying that he, so because in all the trial and all, you know, Manson gave a lot of interviews. And Lennon is here saying, that he thinks that um, a lot of the things Manson was saying was true. So even after these horrific, horrible things come out, there are people, the counterculture people are like, actually, you know, Manson has some compelling things to say here. You know, maybe we should be listening to him. And and so right away we see people, uh, you know, I don't know, respecting Manson in some way. 
and what people will hold him up as a hero and that he's a hero for hippies, that he's a hero for uh, a hero against the man. He's a hero against conformity. Um, for example, there's a Ramon song, the lyric gonna smile. I'm gonna laugh. You're gonna get a bloodbath. And in the moment of passion, get the glory like Charles Manson. So there's, there's this sort of um, hero worship of Manson, which I find to be highly problematic. <laughs> I mean, there are so many other heroes you can hold up that uh, are not this. Because again, the story to me about Manson is one of, he's a psychopath who has no empathy and was narcissistic. And I don't think he gave a crap about the social movements of the 60s. I think he just adopted that because he knew it was his way in to manipulate people to stay close to him, you know? Famous bands have covered his songs. Guns N' Roses recorded one of his songs. Marilyn, Marilyn Manson recorded one of Charles Manson's songs. And of course, Marilyn Manson named after Charlie Manson. You know, it's a mashup of Marilyn Monroe and Charles Manson. The Lemonheads recorded one of Manson's songs. Of course, the Brian Jonestown Massacre recorded one of his songs. Crispin Glover, if you know Crispin Glover from Back to the Future, uh, has recorded music and recorded one of his songs. Uh, Trent Reznor from Nine Inch Nails actually moved in to the Sharon Tate house um, where the murders happened and uh, established a recording studio there, which he called Pig, which was a reference to one of the words that they had written in blood on the on the door. They they wrote pig. It was a reference to little piggy, and it was uh, of of the Beatles song, and it's also a reference to a, a, a another murder that had happened. Anyway, um, there's been many many books, include the most famous of which is called Helter Skelter, 1974 book, sold seven million copies, and has also been adapted into, into two made for TV movies. There's been many other movies and TV about Manson, an NBC series that came out recently called Aquarius that had David Duchovny and Manson is played by the guy who played Renly Baratheon, if you know that. Anyway, there's a, uh, a documentary in 1973, so just after the murders, uh, called Manson that was Oscar nominated. There's a Netflix comedy called uh, Manson Family Vacation. Um, and it's about a guy who's obsessed with the Manson murders. I mean, this this entire Netflix movie is basically all about people who are obsessed with Manson. And it has a sort of twist at the end that's interesting. I didn't I didn't particularly like the movie. It, it got great reviews though, but when I watched it, I was just like, eh, it's kind of kind of boring. Um, there's a movie uh, Martha Marcy May Marlene that I think has Brie Larson in it, if I'm not mistaken, or was it? Jennifer Lawrence, one of those two, uh, 2011. And it's basically a, uh, a contemporary version of the Manson. It, it, the, the guy that they asked to play Manson or the guy that the, the leader of this fictional cult has a Manson sort of look to him and he played guitar and all that kind of stuff. Quentin Tarantino's movie that's coming out in 2018 is a, is a movie that has something to do with the Manson murders. It's set in LA in 1969. Um, and there's another movie coming out about it. And so, so not only has, was Manson, you know, uh, worshiped in the past, but it's, it's almost maybe even seen a resurgence lately. There was a, a musical in 2014 in Germany that is all about the Manson family. It's a, it's a musical about the Manson family and the murders, a musical. <laughs> um, uh, Manson I should mention that Manson just died actually he he like just last month or early November just he died so that's another sort of detail here um, Manson while he was in prison for you know so he, he went into prison early mid 30s and um, he died when he, uh, 80s I think he he received more there's here's some quotes in terms of the fan mail that he got or just mail that he got. Manson has received more mail than any other prisoner in the United States. He each year estimated receives 60,000 letters, 60,000 letters. There's no way he can read all those, right? 60,000 letters. How many is that a day? It was at like 200 a day. 
Um, am I doing my back of the napkin right there? Yeah, I think 200, 200 a day letters. Um, that's insane. I had no idea. I mean, I knew people wrote him, but I would have thought, yeah, he probably gets like a letter every few days or something. No, he gets 60,000 letters a year. People visit him all the time. They want to talk to him. People want to interview him. People want to learn from him. Um, and, uh, you know, all these kinds of things. He's tried to escape a few times unsuccessfully. He's tried to be paroled unsuccessfully. Um, now, what was his mental illness, if we're going to talk about some psychology here? Did he suffer from a mental illness? Well, it, it's, it's, there's a lot of debate within um, professionals who have assessed him. He's been diagnosed with schizophrenia. He's been diagnosed with paranoid delusional disorder. Um, but it's hard to know if he suffered from any mental illness because he, there's a lot of accounts of him saying to people before he was arrested that if he ever did get caught, he would, he would fake his, he would, he knew how to fake that he had a mental disorder is a thing. And he said he would fake that he had a mental disorder. I've never assessed him, but lo- looking at a lot of the interviews and, and how lucid he comes across, I would say that he, he doesn't, he's not delusional. He had delusional ideas, but I think he actually just made those up because he knew that it would, uh, you know, be in line with what people would believe, you know? And, uh, but he's clearly, he clearly has antisocial personality disorder and he's clearly a psychopath. I mean, he, he is like a quintessential psychopath. Um, Incidentally, while he was in prison, he made a lot of enemies in prison. And one guy actually tried to burn him alive. He doused him in paint thinner and lit him on fire and actually severely burned him. And he has a lot of scar. He had a lot of scars from that. Um, Another interesting little bit here about the obsession with Manson. So this is me looking at the people looking at the, at the Mona Lisa. You know, this is me just observing and going, huh, look at all those selfie sticks. Um, In 2010, Manson became engaged to a 27 year old woman, 26, 27 year old woman. He was in his eighties or he was in his late seventies. And it was a national story. It's like, Oh my God, you know, this, this young woman who kind of looks like one of the Manson girls. Um, but it later came out that she only became engaged to him because she wanted to own his corpse after he died. So she could charge money to display it. And so, um, that engagement came to an end before he died. Um, also incidentally there, so there's a lot of stories about the followers. Uh, there's a lot of future crimes actually that the followers committed, including squeaky from that was her nickname squeaky. He, she's one of his famous, um, family members. And a few years after the arrest and everything, she tried to kill president Ford. She actually got close to president Ford. She had a gun and she pulled the trigger and it had four bullets in the magazine, but she hadn't she hadn't put a bullet in the chamber. Um, if you're familiar with you know those kinds of guns, you have to you have to put a bullet into the chamber before um, you know before you shoot it. And so it's unclear if she knew there wasn't a bullet in, in the chamber or not. I'm guessing she did not know because um, I don't know. It just seems like a strange act and plus why would you put any bullets in the gun if if you weren't planning on but anyway she claims that she knew that there wasn't a bull in the chamber i don't think that's true so she was very close to killing president ford one of one of manson's followers um she was arrested and put in prison uh for many years and she was released in 2009 at the age of 61 and you can look up documentaries about her as well so yeah um Manson just died November 19th, actually, which as I record this was just last week. <laughs> um, by the time this comes out, it'll, it'll be a little, uh, this will probably come out mid-December, I'm thinking. Um, actually, maybe I'll release it earlier because of this whole media frenzy. Anyway, um, he died of natural causes in the hospital. He was he was immediately cremated and his remains were given to his grandson. Okay, so let's talk about the, the psychology about this. Um, you know, there's not much that I can say about the psychology of Charles Manson that I haven't already said or said in other episodes, you know, he was a sadistic psychopath who had no empathy for other people. And he, he wanted to manipulate other people 
so that one, he could feel powerful because everyone likes to feel powerful. And he also wanted, in my hypothesis, he wanted people to be close to him because he needed attachment security just like anybody else did. And but he was he had a very dysfunctional way of, of getting attachment security. And this is the way he was taught. He, he was taught by his mother that this is what you do. Um, the, the victims and the families of the victims uh, really must hate the fact that we're even talking about him 50 years later. It must be very distressing to them that, that uh, his name comes up and that people wear his face on T-shirts and stuff. You know, it must just be really horrible. Um, so that's another uh, bit of the psychology thing that we need to consider here, which, again, I debated as to whether or not I would even make this episode. I debated what, you know, whether or not I wanted to tell a story. Part of the reason why I want to tell a story is because I had I was under the impression that Char- Char- Charlie Manson had a sort of romantic story to him, but I, I hope it's clear from my from the fuller story. And and when you when you learn the even fuller story, you realize just how unromantic the whole thing is. He he sort of haphazardly just sort of fall falls into these situations, and he's just so desperate and you know, these young impressionable people and the way they committed the murders was just so weird and, and not thought out. And his, his dogma was just a mishmash of weird things. And, and it just, it's so unglamorous. It's just a sad man leading a bunch of other sad people who did a bunch of sad things. And to, to hold up this, to, to, to write music about this guy or to have him on a t-shirt is just like, it's just so sad. He's just such a pathetic individual, you know, he's pathetic, you know, to me when you not pathetic, like, uh, you're pathetic. It's just like, I'm actually just like, man, he's just kind of a dirty, he smelled all the time when, when he would go into the, to the, um, uh, recording studio, he, people would say, Oh my God, that guy stinks. You know, he, he's, he was desperate to impress people in, with his music. You know, he really legitimately wanted to be a rock star. And he thought he was great on guitar and he wasn't. You know, it's just, it's just a sad, it, to me, it's, it's analogous to when you watch um, American Idol or something. Again, this is a far analogy, <laughs> but when you're watching American Idol and you, you just see some really desperate person desperately trying to get approval from the judges and you just immediately know oh this person is not, doesn't have the talent they you know and, and it and it looks like they think they have talent which is fine you know they can anyone can think they have talent but but it almost looks like this person really believes they're awesome and you know i, I it's great to see him singing it, you know singing is wonderful but in terms of like what these judges are looking for, this person does not have what it takes. You know, those people aren't murdering people or anything, but I'm saying that's the vibe I get from the story of Charlie, Charlie Manson. It's just like him and a bunch of other people who are very confused about life um, following him. And it, it just, it just has a very sad, pathetic quality to it. And, a, and just a tragedy, you know, it's like, dude, why are you killing people? What's, you know, bad drug deal gone, you know, a drug deal gone bad. Okay. You know, not good, but at least there's some logic to it. Um, but the Sharon Tate murders, like, dude, what, you know, and then the whole thing about him wanting to start a race words and, and how, how stupid that was. And how, even if, even if there was some, you know, logic to that, it's like um, the clues you left were so bad that, no one thought it was black people <laughs> when police were very apt to believe that black people, you know, would, would do such a thing. You know, it's like, you just, just sad, pathetic people of average intelligence doing just, just sad, pathetic things. And so, so anyway, that, that's why I told the story and I hope that that is the, that's the gestalt. Now, again, that's a value judgment. You know, everyone's free to have their own value judgment on it, but, but, I, I don't know. I, I just, I, I hope that is the message. Anyway, let's take a break and we get back. Let's continue this. Mm-hmm. 
All right, we're back from the break. Again, this episode is brought to you by Talkspace. If you're looking for online counseling, go to Talkspace. Very convenient. Use the promo code Kirk, though. You got to use the promo code K-I-R-K. It's pretty cheap. I, I think, you know, I, I should have the, the prices in front of me, but I, I think like per session, it's it's like very cheap. And I think you get like sessions every day. So um, they're short sessions every day. You know, they're not full hour. But anyway, I, uh, people have emailed me and said, I tried Talkspace and I love it. I'm connected with, uh, uh, you know, Talkspace, they only work with people who are fully licensed. So it's people like me who are fully licensed, who know what they're doing. They're trained on how to do that kind of therapy. And so anyway, Talkspace.com, use the promo code Kirk. Okay. Um, the other thing about psychology that that's pretty obvious that we can talk about is that the followers were classic cases of Stockholm syndrome. You have a charismatic leader who's very confident. He looked for young people who were running away from home because they, they didn't like their families. He drugs them with LSD, you know, during his sermons, he isolates them. He scares them. He beats them. He convinces them that he is their savior. And without him, they could, you know, they could be harmed. Um, and that, that's probably another reason why he, uh, did the murders was it's like, well, if I can get my cult to murder people, then they really need me because now the world really is out to get us, you know? So that's another reason I think why people do this. You know, when you look at the Waco situation, I think that's a similar thing. When, when, when Koresh was threatened, he was sort of backed into a corner where it's like, if he didn't, if he didn't come out swinging, then his cult was going to fly apart real in very real ways. But anyway, so, so let's, let's ask this question. Why are, why are we so obsessed with Charlie Manson? Why is, why was Charlie Manson getting 60,000 letters a day? Why are there musicals about him? Why are there so many books and documents? Why am I even making this episode about him? You know, it's very, it's very weird to me until you just look at American society in terms of media consumption. This story has it all. It has murder, which of course we love. I mean, all you have to do is, is look at movies and count the amount of times humans are killed and just be like, clearly we love that. You know, think about all the other behaviors that humans are capable of, you know, like taking care of a, of a bird (laughs) or um, planting a tree or, feeding somebody or getting a job or um, painting a picture. Um, Now think about all those behaviors and then think about how many times you've seen someone paint a picture in a movie and how many times you've seen someone kill someone in a movie. movie. Um, We love stories about murder. We just love killing. We love shooting. We love blood. You know, it's just all the movies, all the crime procedurals, CSI and all of its different, you know, law and order, all of its different uh, manifestations, uh, you know, um, unsolved mysteries, just, we are just, we are eternally fascinated with murder. Uh, Crime, this story has crime in it, obviously. It has a cult, which we love cults. It has sex orgies. I didn't even get into the sex orgies, by the way. There were tons of sex orgies, like um, Manson, you know, directed everyone to have sex orgies all the time. Drugs, ton of drugs, mescaline, obviously pot, alcohol. Um, was heroin involved? Anyway, um, MDA, L- famous people, tons of famous people. You know, you got Roman Polanski, who was, you know, pretty famous at the time. Uh, Rosemary's Baby, Sharon Tate. You, you had Doris Day with her. She was connected to this. You had... Um, uh, murder she wrote woman the the uh, angela lansbury was involved the, her daughter or something anyway there's all these the beach boys neil young crosby stills nash like it, it there's so many famous people who were connected to this oh incidentally the night that the sharon tate murders happened there were lots of people who claimed they were invited to that party and would have been killed but they just for one reason or another didn't go like uh, Mama Cass was supposed to be there, um, a whole bunch of other people. In some ways, it's sort of like it gets a little ludicrous because something like a thousand people have claimed they were invited to that party that night. 
even though only six, six people were there. And so it's like, what's the chance that Sharon Tate invited all those people? Because everyone wanted to be connected to it, which is another weird thing. Why would you want to be connected to that? Why would you want to be like, oh my God, I was invited to that party too. I want every, I want to, I want to be connected to that story. It's just, just a weird compulsion that people have. Um, so yeah, lots of famous people. You have, it's in Hollywood, you know, or, you know, it's, it's um, connected to Hollywood. There's all the music stuff, you know, all the, people love the beach boys and neil young you know there's it's like all it's this trivia around those people that you're interested in tons of pictures lots of pictures like for instance when um rowan polanski landed in la for whatever reason he, he had um a, a journalist with him taking pictures as he went into the tate house so the the there was still blood everywhere and Roma Plansky, so because it was his house, you know, it was Sharon Tate and Roma Plansky's house, and so um, there's all these pictures that you could find online of Roma Plansky walking around this house and and looking at where his very pregnant wife was, you know, stabbed and murdered and had her blood written everywhere. It's a, there's just all these pictures. So, you know, think about before the internet, particularly, you have the 70s and 80s where books would come out and documentaries that would actually have these these pictures on display for people and and you know because a lot of these kinds of murders there's not there's not as much um, documentation of it whereas because of the high profile of this there's there were there was a lot of pictures um there's a there's a tragedy to this whole thing there's a there's an interesting police investigation and and police procedural to the whole thing. There was a there's a trial that was very, that had, you know, an O.J. Simpson esque sort of trial with lots of Manson uh, quotes and and there's a lot of weird after events, you know, like the assass the attempted assassination of of President Ford, and and you have this very I don't want to say photogenic figure, <laughs> um, but Manson, you know, when you look at people like Jeffrey Dahmer and, uh, you know, those, and you take pictures of those guys, you're just like, oh, okay, you know, sort of a, sort of a weird looking kid. But you look at Manson with his hair and the, the X and then eventually a swastika in his forehead and his crazy beard and those eyes, you know, it, there's a, there's a, there's a very compelling image, I think. Um, so, so it's got, you know, it's got all the elements that you want. Same with OJ Simpson, right? You had, you had Hollywood, you had football, you had sex, you know, cause there was all this talk about how, um, Nicole Simpson, D Nicole Brown would have sex orgies or indiscriminate sex, or you had black white relations. So this has, you know, the Manson whole situation has the black white thing in there. And so, so of course Americans would be obsessed with this because it just it just has it all. Um, it has like '60s memorabilia in there. Um, people have said that the Manson murders were the end of the '60s. So the '60s were seen as this, you know, the late '60s were seen as this beautiful time of change and of of communal living and giving to each other, and then Manson comes along and just ends it. But we really need to figure this one out, honestly. I think given what's happening in our society, we need to figure out why we're obsessed with people like Manson, people like Elliot Roger, people like Ted Bundy. We, we need to understand why we are obsessed with this and what we should do with our obsession. Because our obsession with these individuals is hypothesized in something that I I believe to to be true. It's hard to it's almost impossible to to study this, but but our obsession with these killers is one of the main reasons why there has been an increase in these sorts of killers um, in the past few decades. There's been an in increase in the in what we might call like spree killing or indiscriminate killing over the last few decades. There's been a decrease in other kinds of murders, like murders for robbery or domestic violence murders there's been a decrease but there's been an, there's been an increase in these spree killings so we need to figure out why you know because maybe if we understand why we could reduce them now to be sure uh it, there in terms of like 
damage to society, these kinds of killings are actually pretty minuscule. Uh, I've talked about this before. The chance of you being killed in a spree killing is far, far lower than your chance of being killed in a car accident, your chance of uh, killing yourself, actually. Suicide is is much more prevalent than uh, than indiscriminate murder. Um, so, so there's that. The other thing to put in perspective here is in the past, if we really wanted to focus on trying to reduce death by, by murder or by killing, one of the best things we've done over the past 60 years is reduce the amount of huge wars that we in, engage in. World War I, World War II in particular, killed millions upon millions upon millions of people. And and it was in a lot of ways pointless. There was just there was no reason for World War II to have happened. And you know Germany and Japan just decided for their own um, stupid gain, just decided let's let's start killing mil- and raping millions and millions of people. And so, and then uh, the Russians got involved, and we got in, you know, and then we had to kill them to get them to stop. And and it was just horrible. So. So in terms of the grand scheme of things, uh, indiscriminate spree killing, serial killing, is it's terrible. But it, in the grand scheme of safety to the human race, there are perhaps other efforts that we are putting effort into that are much more profitable, shall we say. Anyway, um, but yeah, we're still seeing an increase in, in U.S. men uh, going on, uh, men in the U.S. going on killing sprees. Um, it's so much so that it's it's become boring in the news, right? Like, um, I I didn't even hear about this one, but it just happened a few days ago as I record this. November 23, 2017, the Rancho Tehama Reserve shootings in which five people were killed and 18 others were injured. Uh, and I'm not under a a, a rock, you know? I, I, I actually look at um, Reddit, the, the front page of the news page, you know, there's a, on Reddit, there's a front news page. Um, and I look at that, I don't know, probably a few times a day, honestly. And so I didn't even hear about this one. If, if this, if you had a killing of five people and 18 other people injured in the United States, uh, even 10 years ago, it would be news for, for months. I would, I would guess. Um, but now it's like, oh yeah, just you know, just another, just another boring uh, spree killer who just decided to, um, you know, a similar thing happened um, earlier this month with the Sutherland Springs Church shooting. I mean, I definitely heard about that and and read a few articles about, you know, the guy who went to a church and and killed a bunch of people on Sunday morning. Uh, the but the thing that. Um, is interesting about this in terms of what I'm saying here is that 25 he killed 25 people and injured 20 more 25 people so one guy with 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 weapons went into a church and killed 25 people now this was you know a definite story that um, you'd have to be under a rock not to have heard about but but it was only talked about for probably like a week maybe two weeks. If this happened 10 years ago, maybe even just five years ago, we would be talking about this for years. This would be, I mean, a guy walks into a church uh, in this, in this, in, was it in Texas? Um, can't remember exactly where, but so that's another thing. I don't even know what state this was in. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, 10, five, 10 years ago, particularly 20 years ago, some guy walks into a church and kills 25 people we're going to be talking about that for a while. I mean, think Columbine. How many people died in Columbine? 15 people died in Columbine, including the killers. So 13 victims. So think about that. Columbine. Now, of course, the there's video footage of it, and it's at a school, so that raises its profile, of course. But, but still, comp- we're still talking about Columbine. This, this church... Uh, shooting 25 dead, I'm guessing will be a blip. You know, it, it's again, my, my point here is that it's, it's on such a rise that it's, it's become commonplace. And I think part of the reason why it's on the rise is because we are just the way our society and the way our media deals with people who do this sort of thing 
creates more of them. You know, we all know about copycat. Well, we we're 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 creating one big cycle of copycat killers. You know, for people who are desperate, who are thinking about suicide anyway, and they have a a bone to pick with society or a particular group of people or maybe even a, an individual, and and they're narcissistic and they want to go out with a bang and they you know think, well, I'm going to kill myself. Might as well, uh, might as well get some fame. Which I find to be just just one of the weirdest logics. It's like you're going to be dead, so what's the point? Um, but you know, and that and so so the fact that we the fact that our society has an obsession with people like Charles Manson, um, I think I think perpetuates this. And and maybe our obsession with Charlie Manson in particular actually makes this makes other people like this more likely to do it. So I don't have the answer to that, honestly. I don't know what to do. I mean, part of the answer is when we have these kinds of killings in the media, and there's some movements along these lines, we need to not we, we need to not talk about the individual who did it. Like the guy in Vegas who did all the killing from the Mandalay Bay Hotel. Um, we, we don't really know why he did it. And I think the police are holding that um, information. And I think that's a good idea because if it comes out, I know we all want to know why, but if we know why, what good does that do us? It doesn't help us at all, really. And the, the, the knowing why then becomes very talked about. And then other people who want to get their why out there might do this. You know, someone who's like, well, I want everyone to know that I hate ISIS or I hate Trump or something. And so I'm going to go kill these people because, and that, cause, and then they'll, and they'll kill myself. And then everyone will look into this as to why I did it. They'll, they'll see that I hated Trump and then I'll get my message out to everybody. So to some extent, we need to stop reporting on the individual, on their life and on the reasons why we, do, we need to focus on the victims. We need to focus on safety. We need to focus on other kinds of things and, um, and not use this uh, as a platform for individuals to publicize their, their life and their ideas. Um, so why as a society, why as individuals are we interested in this sort of thing? Well, I think that there's various reasons. One is, is there's a compulsion to know what other people know. You know, have you, have you ever been at a dinner party and someone's like, um, so did you hear about uh, blah, blah, blah in the news? And you're like, uh, nope. And they're like, what? You haven't heard about such and such? You know, imagine you just are avoiding the news for a while and for a week you didn't know about the Harvey Weinstein thing. And then you're at a party and someone's like, oh my God, you know, Harvey Weinstein, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, huh, who's Harvey Weinstein? And the person looks at you like, what's wrong with you that you're not paying attention to this? Or do you not care? There's this sort of compulsion that we have as individuals in our society to be up to date so that, that we're not humiliated by not, by not knowing about something, you know? So I think that's one very simple reason as to why we all want to know about these killers. Another one is that, um, that I think is perhaps more relevant is that we want power. All of us feel powerless. All of us feel powerless against people who threaten us, against our bosses, against society, against police officers, against politicians. We all very much know that we do not have power a lot of times. And wouldn't it be nice if we had power? You know, and Charlie Manson in his story, he clearly had power over people. He had all the sex he wanted. He got people to to kill people for him. He he managed to work his way into the hearts of fame famous musicians, you know, like Neil Young and and Wilson. Uh, when he didn't like someone, he killed them. You know, when when he when rich people did him wrong, he got back at them. And this is very compelling. It's not consciously compelling. People aren't like, oh yeah, I want to be like Manson because I want to kill my enemies. No, it's not like that. What it is is um, this is why revenge movies, you know, like Taken, are so compelling to us. We we want to internalize those figures. We want we want to feel their power because wouldn't it be nice? 
if we could just kill our enemies, you know, that, that guy who uh, tried to run me off the road the other day, wouldn't it be nice if I could just snap my fingers and they'd be gone? Wouldn't that be nice? And so these people, I think, are obsessed upon because of the, the power that we perceive that they had, whether or not they had it or not is irrelevant, but we want their power because we are all, we are all very terrified of our powerlessness. Also, we're afraid. Uh, we, we're all afraid of people like this. And so when we perceive a threat of anything, there, there are various different ways of coping with that. One is, is to just look away, but another one is to look toward it. You know, it's, it's why we rubberneck on the freeway. It's why we watch horror movies. It's why we were so compelled to look at the news. If it, if it bleeds, it leads, right? Because when there's danger in the world, one of the ways that, that we likely evolved to deal with that danger is to pay attention to the danger, right? It's like, ooh, there is a pack of hyenas uh, over, you know, beyond, and they're eating uh, one of my fellow tribes people. Um, I better stare at that because if if I don't pay attention to that danger, then I could be killed too. And so when we have a situation where uh, there's there's high profile murders and there's a lot of details to it, there's this compulsion to uh, to try to absorb all the details of I need to learn everything there is to know about that situation. Because when I have all the details, then I will know how to protect myself. And of course, this is illogical because the uh, one, the murders that Manson engaged in were completely random. So there's no way to protect yourself against that, really. The other is that individuals like Manson are so rare. You know, as I've been saying, People with his background, the vast majority, 99.99% of the people with his, his exact background do not go on to murder anybody. They might intimidate people. They might um, have psychopathy, blah, blah, blah. They might commit crimes, but they're not going to murder because murder is actually extremely rare. And so knowing Manson isn't going to help you, really. Um, now, having said that, knowing the story will help a lot of people when it comes to protecting yourself from uh, people who like to manipulate others and they like to use intimidation to, to get you to appease and get you into their circle so they can further control you. That is a very common thing actually. Um, uh, and uh, many people have experienced that in their life and many people are right now. I know many of you listeners have experienced and or are in relationships that are like that, where your partner is basically like a mini version of Manson, someone who like systematically breaks you down and uh, sermons and uh, intimidates you into appeasing them, you know? So I guess there is some usefulness to that, but I don't think we have to talk about Manson. I think we could just talk about um, that phenomenon in general. Another reason is escapism. I think we focus on Manson because we want to escape. Many of us are anxious about our lives or we hate our lives and we're looking for something interesting to focus on. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with this, but it, it explains why I think we, we love Law and & Order and CSI and Manson and that kind of stuff. So my point of all this is that we need to find other ways to meet our needs. We, we need to find other ways to get power. We need to have other ways of dealing with powerlessness that we have. We need to have other ways of dealing with our own fears. We, we need to have other ways of escaping other than propping up people like Charles Manson, which creates copycat people uh, that want to get fame in the same way that Charles Manson has. Our, at the very least, what we need to stop doing is stop worshiping the guy. <laughs> um, you know, he, he's a horrible person who did horrible things. And there should be no glamorizing of this. That is... I think is is not okay. Now, I'm not proposing some kind of uh, ban or book burning or anything like that. What what I'm saying is, so let me let me give an example. Guns and Roses they covered a Charlie Manson song on their um, Spaghetti Incident album, which was early '90s, and Slash has more recently in an interview said that he regrets 
covering that song. He, 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 at the time, he says, well, at the time, you know, we just thought it was sort of ironic that we would record a Charlie Manson song. We thought it was just sort of a, like, kind of like a sick joke that we would record one of Manson's songs. But now looking back, I, I think it's pretty stupid because uh, Manson was a terrible person and why would we want to even bring attention to the guy? And so it's stuff like that. It's not a matter of banning anything. It's a matter of artists and other people, other creators, understanding the impact of, of doing that. Because if you understand the impact, my guess is you wouldn't do it. If, if you knew that the family members of the victims, and maybe even some of, the, some of the Manson family members themselves, when they're reminded of those events, it's not pleasant for them. You know, it, it'd be like having a, a funny musical about the Holocaust or something. It, you, you, you have to take into account the, the impact it will have on people who were there. And uh, I think when, we, when people really consider that, I think that uh, tends to be incorporated into their decision-making, which will likely, I think, result in less um, activity of this sort of nature. The, the other thing that I think everyone should consider as they're creating art, as they're publishing things, is the impact it'll have on copycat, you know, um, situations. And maybe that will cause them to say, yeah, I don't think we need another article on Manson. Or maybe it will be like, well, how do I want to tell this story? Do I want to tell a story that emphasizes all the glitz and glamour and the Sharon Tates and the Beach Boys and the blah, blah, blah? Or do I want to tell a story that has a different tone to it? You know, one that maybe props up Sharon Tate, one that props up Roman Polanski, one that, I mean, Roman Polanski has his own problem. I should do a whole episode on him, actually. At some point, he's got some issues for sure. Um, anyway, my point is, is that we need to really be, we need to think critically about the way our society and way our media and, and the way creators incorporate Manson into their creations. Because to date, I don't think it's been done in a, resp- in a responsible way. All right, well, that does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle. Thanks for joining us. Please take care of yourself because you deserve it. Mm-hmm.